Oh, Ga I thought Gabby was going to say something. Okay, wait, sorry. I'm not, uh, I still see this, the Ocean's Eleven screen. Is that right? Oh, okay, here we are. Okay, it's showing. Come to me, screen. Doing Hello? good. Okay, hold on. I'm spotlighting myself. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, it's on Robin right now. <laughs> One second. Now it's on Carly. It's delay. Okay. Hello. Uh, this is Gabby. Uh, I <laughs> welcome to the show. Uh, I am wearing black as I am part of the crew. Um, our stage directions person is going to be Carly Uzin, and she's uh, going to read. She's going to tell who everyone is and also read the stage directions. So goodbye. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, they're saying that they might want to do gallery view, but I think we should keep it like this, right? <laughs> Gallery view is you can see everyone up top, right? Um, we could do even like a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, let's, do, let's do it so you can see people on top. Why not? Is that okay? And then, thank you so much. Technical stuff. Okay. And then as soon as I can see that, I'm going to give Carly the, the cue to start. Okay, Carly, go for it. Thank you, Gabby. Hi, everyone. I'm Carly. Uh, I'm in charge now. Uh, today, we are going to do a queer live reading of Ocean's Eleven uh, from 2001. Uh, screenplay by Ted Griffin, based on a screenplay by Harry Brown and Charles Litterer, and a story by George Clayton Johnson, Jack Golden Russell. Actually, a human, not a dog. First, we're going to introduce our cast. Um, I will say the name of the role, the, the character who played them in the original 2001 film and then who was playing them today and going to do a much better job than in the original film. Uh, so up first, uh, we have uh, the role of Danny Ocean, originally played by George Clooney, will be played by Stephanie Beatrice. Hi. The role of Rusty Ryan, originally played by Brad Pitt, will be played by Jen Richards. Hey, everybody. The role of Terry Benedict, originally played by Andy Garcia, will be played by Brittany Nichols. Hello. The role of Linus Caldwell, originally played by Matt Damon, will be played by Jess Tom. Stop. How's it going? It's going really well. Oh, you were talking to the audience. Uh, the role of Tess Ocean, originally played by Julia Roberts, will be played by Symphony Sanders. Hello. The, I've lost my place. The role of uh, Ruben Tishkoff, originally played by Elliot Gould, will be played by Mal Blum. Hello. Hello. The, the role of Saul Bloom, originally played by Carl Reiner, will be played by Mara Wilson. Hello. The role of Frank Catton, originally played by Bernie Mac, will be played by Alexis G. Zoll. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. The role of Livingston. That role, originally played, uh, originally played by Eddie Jemison, will be played Hi. by Drew Gregory. The role of Basher Tarr, originally played by Don Cheadle, will be played by Brian Michael Smith. Hello, hello. The role of Virgil Malloy, originally played by Casey Affleck, will be played by Natasha... Na Damn it, I practiced this in everything. I had a feeling. I was waiting for it. Nego Vanless. It's Greek. Uh, yeah. Hey. Practiced. I fucked it up. Uh, the role of Turk Malloy, originally played by Scott Kahn, will be played by Elise Bauman. What's up? How's it going? Uh, and then a whole lot of roles will be played by Keely Weiss, Kirsten King, and the one and only Robin Romer. Hello. Hi. All right. I will begin. <clears throat> Ocean's Eleven. Fade in, empty room with single chair. We hear a door open and close, followed by approaching footsteps. Danny Ocean, dressed in prison fatigues, enters frame and sits. Good morning. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Daniel Ocean. Thank you. Mr. Ocean, the purpose of this meeting is to determine whether, if released, you're likely to break the law again. 
While this was your first conviction, you've been implicated, though never charged, in over a dozen other confidence schemes and frauds. What can you tell us about this? As you say, ma'am, I was never charged. Mr. Ocean, oh, sorry. Interior parole board hearing room wider view morning. Three parole board members sit opposite Danny behind a table. Mr. Ocean, what we're trying to find out is, was there a reason you chose to commit this crime or was there just a reason you simply got caught this time? My wife left me. I was upset. I got into a self-destructive pattern. If released, is it likely you would fall back into a similar pattern? She already left me once. I don't think she'll do it again just for kicks. Mr. Ocean, Ocean what do you think you would do if released? I don't know. How much do you guys make a year? Interior, minimum security, prison, checkout station, day. Ocean Daniel. Danny steps forth and guard one doles out his possessions and a form certifying their return to Danny. Sign. This came today for you. Rest will be forwarded to your parole officer. Those are your lawyers? My wife's. What's it say? I'm a free man. Interior, changing cubicle. Danny pulls on civilian clothes and there's not a bare thread among them. He tugs his cuffs and smiles. The old skin feels good. One last item to don, a silver wedding band. Danny considers it. Will he put it on? Exterior, minimum security prison front gate afternoon. A sign reads, New Jersey State Minimum Security Correctional Facility. Someone has graffitied below it. If you were in prison, you'd be home now. The great metal door opens and Danny stands within its frame ready for release. If it matters, and if you notice, he is wearing his wedding ring. He hovers there for a moment on the precipice of freedom. The wind whistles a little on the other side of the gate and the view ahead is not pleasant, New Jersey. That's rude. Life is hard out there. But Danny musters his courage then takes his first step into free America. Exterior, Atlantic City, boardwalk, dusk, an empty wintry boardwalk. Interior, casino, Atlantic City, night. And his wingtip lands squarely on plush red carpeting. As we pull up to Danny's face and spin around him, we hear and then see the buzz of a casino floor, the hum of conversation, the ding, 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 and thunk, thunk, thunk from the slots, the brisk whir of shuffled cards. And to Danny, it's a, it's a hearth and a fire and a comfy chair and a snifter of brandy. He's home. On Danny's wallet, as he pulls out several crisp 100s, sets them on green felt, then sees them replaced by, by a neat pile of chips. At blackjack table, Danny cranes his neck about the casino looking for someone, a friend, somebody who should be here, but without success. He turns his attention back to his cards and the cards of the dealer. 19, stay, dealer 17, Danny wins, king four, dealer shows a six, stick, dealer busts, queen ace, 21, Danny wins again. A second dealer relieves the first and Danny recognizes him with a smile. This wasn't the friend he was scouting for, but two hours out of the joint, any familiar face is welcome. Hello, Frank. The new dealer, Frank Catton, glances up at Danny and his eyes go wide like a priest who's discovered he's dealing communion wafers to the pontiff himself. He quickly hides his astonishment. I beg your pardon, sir. You must have me confused with someone else. My name's Ramon. See? My mistake. Table's cold anyway. You might try the lounge at the Grand, sir. It gets busy around one. Thanks. The interior lounge at the Grand. Danny checks his watch, 12.58. Then the lounge around him. Prison had more nightlife. He nurses a bourbon, folds back the New York Times, and scans. His eyes move down the page and stop at a header. Vegas's Paradiso to be raised. Former owner denounces plans, accompanied by two photographs. The first, tan, well coiffed developer and new owner of the Paradiso, Terry Benedict, with a beautiful, if barely visible, woman, woman on his arm. The second, scowling former owner, Ruben Tishkoff. Catching up on current events? Ramon. Glad to meet you. Frank Catton wouldn't get by the gaming board. You just out? This afternoon. And already turning over a new leaf. You seen him? Last I heard he was in LA teaching movie stars how to play cards. Why, you don't have something planned already? Are you kidding? I just became a citizen again. Jesus. Interior sub shop night, moving with Danny and Frank. It's tough now, our line of work. Everybody's so serious. Too many guns, too many computers. What are you gonna do? Steal from ordinary people? That would be criminal. So what's left? Banks? <laughs> Banks got no money. It's all electronic. Only place that still carries cash is casinos. Casinos. Oh no. 
Oh, yes. When? Soon. Interested? Interior sub shop foyer night. Danny pulls a business card from his jacket, picks up the phone again, and dials the card's number. Yes, Officer Brooks. My name's Danny Ocean. I'm just sad I'm supposed to check in with you within 24 hours. Uh, no, sir. I haven't gotten into any trouble. No drinking, sir. Nope. I wouldn't even think of leaving the state. Off the sound of a jet flyover, we cut to exterior Hollywood Club rear entrance night. Pulling off the Capitol Records building, we pick up Rusty leaning against his Ford Falcon. Hey, hey, Rusty. I'm moving with him and Topher Grace, the actor, as they push down a back alley. Hey, uh, I don't know if you're, you know, like incorporated or anything, like Rusty Ryan, uh, I don't know, incorporated, but you should think about it really, because uh, I was talking to my manager yesterday. Uh, Bernie? No, not Bernie. I mean, not that Bernie, uh, my business manager. He's actually also a Bernie. But he was telling me that since this, like what we do could be considered like research for, you know, a future gig or something that uh, I should be able to write it off as like a business expense. So he su suggested that it'd be better if I uh, wrote you a check and, um, yeah, you know, or we can keep, let's keep it cash. Yeah, that's better. Good idea. They enter a Hollywood club where they must weave through hordes of young Hollywood nightclubbers. All right, who's here? Uh, Josh is here, Seth is here, David couldn't make it. Uh, he's got two weeks of reshoots on uh, Lusitania because somebody just figured out that 40% of the budget's coming from Germany, so. That's a problem. Uh, Barry's here. I thought they let him out to do the, the HBO thing in Vancouver. Couldn't work out the dates. Oh, and uh, he brought his girlfriend. Wait, not, not the one from... Um... Uh-huh. Huh. I mean, I quit watching when Kate left on after his accident. They pass on and into interior back room night, small but stylish. Rusty enters, Topher in tow. Good evening, guys. Let's play some cards. A glance at the table reveals the three waiting players are all young TV stars. Joshua Jackson, Seth Green, Barry Watson, here for a group poker lesson with Rusty. One star, indeed, has brought his girlfriend Katie, also a known actress, to observe. A glance back at Rusty reveals he's in for a long night. And let's play some cards. At table later, the group lesson has begun. A uh, hundred bucks to me. Oh, uh, what the hell, pocket change call. Why you bet a certain way is your business, but you have to make them think you're betting for a reason. Understand? Later. Seth, you know what you have. Look at them, doesn't change it. Leave them where they are and make your bet. Later. You're showing, yeah. I know she's your girlfriend, Barry, but you can't. Thank you. Later. Josh, deal to your left. Later, a waitress enters from the club and dance music enters with her as she distributes a fresh round. One McCallum neat and four bottled waters. Rusty takes in the sight, bottled fucking water on a poker table. Two pair, nines and twos. You got me. You know what? Let's take a little break. Interior Hollywood Club night. At the bar, Rusty orders a double. He needs it. Hey, how's the game going? It's been the longest hour of my life. What's that? I'm running away with your wife. Cool, man. Uh, out of the corner of his eye, he catches the sight of a man passing through the pulsating crowd, someone familiar to him. He follows. Interior Hollywood Club deep back room, Rusty returns. Uh, hey, Rusty, we got another player. That's all right. Topher indicates the new arrival. It's Danny. Rusty looks as if there's a bad smell in the room. What's this? The bouncer mentioned there was a game in progress. I hope I'm not intruding. Yeah, no intrusion at all, man. What's his name, the bouncer? I don't remember. Yeah, a card player with amnesia. This should be fun. At table, moments later, Rusty deals the next hand. Uh, what do you do for a living, Mr. Ocean, if you don't mind me asking? Why should I mind? Two cards, please. I just got out of prison. Really? Really? Uh, Barry, you're showing again. Oh, sorry. Oh, what did you go to prison for? I stole things. What, like jewels, diamonds? 
Incan matrimonial head masks. From a museum? Gallery. There's a lot of money in those Incan matrimonial head masks. Some. <laughs> no, no, don't let them fool you, Seth. There's boatloads. If you can move the things. One card to me. But you can't. My fence seemed confident enough. If you're dealing with cash, you don't need a fence. Some people just lack vision. Yeah, probably everybody in cell block B. Now the other players realize these guys have a relationship. In fact, a criminal one. And judging from their steely glares across the table, not a happy one. Well, that's all behind us now. I should hope so. I raise you $500. Guys, day one, what's the first rule of poker? Leave emotion at the door. Yeah, that's right. Now my friend here just raised me out of peak. Today's lesson, how to draw out a bluff. This early in the game, that much money, I'm thinking he's holding nothing better than a pair of face cards. Seth, raise him. Okay, uh, you're 500 and another two? Tove? Uh, seven and me plus three, uh, what the hell? Yeah, indeed, but be careful you don't push them too high too fast. Wanna keep them on the leash. I call. What's that to me, a thousand? All you have to do is call. What, your girlfriend holding your purse? <sighs> Contrary to what Mr. Ryan may say, Seth, I always check my cards before I make a bet. But be careful. I could tell from your face you're holding a three of a kind of better. 500 call and two grand more. Guys, you're free to do what you like. It's a lot of money, but I'm staying in. He's trying to buy his way out of the bluff. Nobody looks too eager to call, but nobody wants to leave a grand on the table either. Finally, Seth ponies up and the others not to be outdone do to. We call. Danny sets down his hand, four nines, it's a winner. The others' jaws drop, throw in their cards. For the first time tonight, Rusty Blanches. Ah, uh, shit. Um, sorry, guys. I, I was sure he was bluffing. Well, thanks for the game, fellas. Hey, uh, I hate to ask you this, but could you sign something for me? It's for the guys in the joint. They just love all your shows. Exterior Hollywood Club night. A queue of club goers erupt in a frenzy as Topher and company exit, and they begin signing autographs. Danny and Rusty exit too, but of course nobody gives a shit about them. Interior, Rusty's Falcon, night. Danny and Rusty ride silently, staring out opposite windows at Sunset Boulevard. That was... Unprofessional? Yeah. <laughs> How was the clink? Did you get the cookies I sent you? Why do you think I came to see you first? 10 grand, half of it's yours. You know, you barge into my new workplace, ruin my professional reputation. Least you could do is tell me you've got something better for me. I got something better for you. Interior Cantor's Deli night. They're sitting in a booth over coffee. How's Tess? All right, tell me. It's tricky. No one's ever done it before. Needs planning, large crew. Mm. Guns? Not loaded ones. It has to be very precise. There's a lot of security, but the take. What's the target? Eight figures each. What's the target? When's the last time you were in Vegas? What? You want to knock over a casino? Exterior downtown LA night. It's after hours downtown, dark, empty, dead. Interior library tower, 40th floor corridor night. Lights out on the 40th, engraved brass announces J.A. Kuhn and Associates Architects. Two flashlight beams strafe wood paneled elegant offices. Danny and Rusty on late night reconnaissance. As Danny prowls a cabinet full of blueprints, Rusty passes the time switching papers from a desk's inbox to its outbox. At last, Danny finds the right set of blueprints and drapes it across the desk. We, however, never see it. The vault at the Bellagio. Uh-oh. Who's Gwen? I think we lost Jen. Okay, one second. Well, please. Uh, 
wait. Oh, hold on. Oh, she's back. She's back. She's back. She had too many beverages. <laughs> oh, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> my dog just hit in my computer. Ah, oh no! <laughs> so what happens when you have too many beverages? <laughs> All right, where are we? <laughs> Carly, you want to go back and yeah, let me get us into this uh, interior library tower at C nineteen, Jen. <laughs> Get in there. Come on. All right, putting the dogs away. <laughs> uh, Jen, we're in C19. Page 13. Got it. Interior library tower, 40th floor corridor, night. Lights out on the 40th. Engraved brass announces J.A. Kuhn and Associates Architects. Two flashlight beam strafe wood paneled elegant offices. Danny and Rusty on late night reconnaissance. As Danny prowls a cabinet full of blueprints, Rusty passes the time switching papers from a desk's inbox to its outbox. At last, Danny finds the right set of blueprints and drapes it across the desk. We, however, never see it. The vault at the Bellagio. If I'm reading these right, and I think that I am, this is probably the least accessible vault ever designed. Oh, no, oops, actually, you know what? I'm wrong. It's definitely the least accessible vault ever designed. Yep. You said three casinos. These feed into the cages of both the Mirage and the MGM Grand, but every dime ends up here. The Bellagio, the Mirage, these are Terry Benedict's places. Yes, they are. You think you'll mind? Yeah, maybe a little more than somewhat. Mm. At 40 floor elevator bay, no ding, the, the elevator just arrives. Its doors part to reveal a security guard within, here to make his tour. A large fellow, he has to duck to exit. Back with Danny and Rusty. As Danny rolls up the set of blueprints, Rusty considers the plan, which in our absence, Danny has pitched him. I mean, you'd need at least a dozen guys during a combination of cons. Like what, you think? Fuck, off the top of my head, I'd say, all right, you're looking at a Bosky, um, a Jim Brown, a Miss Daisy, two Jethro's, and a Leon Sphinx. Mm. Oh, oh, and not to mention the biggest Ella Fitzgerald ever. Where do you think you're gonna get the money to back this? As long as we're hitting these three casinos, we'll get our bankroll. Terry Benedict has a list of enemies. Yeah, but does he have enemies with loose cash and nothing to lose? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Reuben. Mm. We are moving with the security guard as he approaches Danny and Rusty's voices. Back with Danny and Rusty. So? So here's what I think. You should take this plan, you know, uh, kick it around for a week or two, sleep on it. Turn it over in your head, then never bring it up to me again. Uh-huh. So what are you saying? I, I'm saying this is like trying to build a, a house of cards on the deck of a speeding boat. Really? I thought it was much harder than that. Suddenly, the security guard's flashlight beam hits them square in the eyes. Danny and Rusty put their hands up to block the light. Jesus, Oscar, we lowered a little, huh? Oh, sorry. You two done up here? Find what you wanted? Yeah, thanks. You mind if we borrow a couple of these drawings for the night and make some copies? Hold on. I need a reason. And don't say money. Why do this? Why not do it? Because yesterday I walked out of the joint wearing my entire wardrobe and your cold decking team beat cover boys. Because the house always wins. You play long enough, never changing the stakes, the house takes you. Unless when that Special hand comes around, you bet big, and then you take the house. All right. You've been practicing that speech, haven't you? Little. Did I rush it? I felt like I rushed no, no, no. it. Good. I thought you got right. Yeah, it's good. They step on the elevator as the door closes. I wonder what Ruben will say. Exterior Tishkoff's opulent backyard in Las Vegas, day. Ruben Tishkoff, the grimace of a man in mid-movement, forever cemented on his face, scrutinizes his two lunch guests at his poolside. You're out of your goddamn minds. Are you listening to me? You are, both of you, nuts. I know more about casino security than any man alive. I invented it, and it cannot be beaten. 
They got cameras, they got watches, they got locks, they got timers, they got bots. They got enough armed personnel to occupy Paris. Okay, that's a, that's a bad example. It's never been tried. Oh, it's been tried. Few guys even came close. You know the three most successful robberies in Las Vegas history? Flashback, Interior Sands, Casino Floor, 1965. And Adelaide Stevenson lookalike approaches a lockbox carrier from behind and snatches the box. He takes almost three steps before five security men leap at him and freeze frame on his wide-eyed expression of horror. Number three, the bronze medal. Pencil neck grabs a lockbox at the sands. He got two steps closer to the door than any living school soul before him. Resume action. Adelaide Stevenson gets a taste of what NFL quarterbacks experience every Sunday, fivefold. Interior, Flamingo Casino Floor, 1971. A hippie races toward the electronic sliding doors, clutching a tray full of chips, and as the doors begin to par part for him, freeze frame, a billy club appears out of nowhere. Second most successful robbery, the Flamingo, 71. This guy actually smelled Frex oxygen before they got him. Resume action. The billy club comes down, whap, across the hippie's skull, and it's, uh, he gets beaten up. Of course he was breathing out a hose the next three weeks, goddamn hippie. Exterior, Ruben Tishkoff's backyard day in the present. And the closest any man has gotten to robbing a Las Vegas casino. Another flashback, exterior, Caesar's Palace entrance, 1987. Tourists and valets scatter as a Euro thief, bursts from the casino and takes five steps before freeze frame, glass explodes from three different doors behind him and he arches his back in agony. Outside of Caesar's in 87, he came, he grabbed, he got conquered. Resume action. Bullets rip the man to shreds and he collapses on Caesar's steps in a bloody pulp. Back to Ruben Tishkoff's backyard, present day. But what am I saying? You guys are pros. The best. I'm sure you can make it out of the casino. Of course, lest we forget, once you're at the front door, you're still in the middle of the fucking desert. You're right. You know, he's right. Ruben, you're right. Our eyes are bigger than our stomachs. Yep, that's exactly it. It's just pure ego. Mm. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much for setting us straight. Mm. Sorry we bothered you. Look, we all go way back. I owe you from the thing with the guy in a place. I'll never forget it. It was our pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I'd never been to Belize. Mm. Give Dominic your addresses. I got some remaindered furniture I want to send you. Just out of curiosity, uh, which casinos did you geniuses pick to rob? The Bellagio Mirage and the MGM Grand. Those are Terry Benedict's casinos. Say, you know, he's right. Mm. You guys, what do you got against Terry Benedict? What do you have against him? That's a real question. Oh, he torpedoed my casino, muscled me out. Now he's going to blow it up next month to make eye for another, another fucking eyesore. Don't think I don't see what you're doing. Yeah? What are we doing, Ruben? You're going to steal from Terry Benedict. You better goddamn know. This sort of thing used to be civilized. You'd hit a guy, he'd whack you, done. But Benedict, woo, at the end of this, he better not know you're involved, not know your names, or think you are dead because he'll kill you. And then he'll go to work on you. That's why we have to be very careful. We have to be precise. We have to be well-funded. Yeah, you gotta be nuts too. And you're gonna need a crew as nuts as you are. Who do you have in mind? Danny and Rusty both smile. They've hooked their fish and so it begins. All right, who's in? Frank C is in. Interior casino office, Atlantic City. Frank Catton coughs mightily into a handkerchief. Across a desk, his boss fills out paperwork. Frank C. has developed a bad case of bronchitis and is putting in a transfer to warmer climates. Exterior Las Vegas airport day. Frank carries his bag toward the taxi bay. He stops to light a cigarette and inhales with deep satisfaction before a banner. Welcome to Las Vegas. What about drivers? Exterior vacant, weedy drag racetrack. Close on a souped up tractor wheeled monster truck. It's engine roaring before a starting line, itching to cross it. Now take a step back. That souped up monster truck stands a foot and a half off the ground and sprouts an antenna from its back bumper. It's a remote controlled co uh, toy. The roaring engine comes from the vehicle next to it, an actual monster truck. Both vehicles peer down the track at a finish line 100 yards away. This is a race. The drivers stare each other down. Turk behind the wheel of the truck and Virgil, trackside, remote control in hand, 
they're nice boys, really. They're nice. I talked to the Molloys yesterday. The Mormon twins? They're both in Salt Lake City, six months off the job. I got the sense they're having trouble filling the hours. Hmm. Lights, lights flash red to yellow to green, and while the truck coats rubber on the track, Virgil's toy zips to a lead. It's looking to be an embarrassment for Turk until he jerks his wheel a little and kathunk flattens his brother's vehicle. Virgil pouts as he plucks up the wreckage of his entry. Electronics? Livingston Dell. Interior surveillance van day on a black and white monitor. Two mobsters on a meet in a public park peer over their shoulders, making certain no one is watching them. Little do they know, Livingston Dell, audiovisual junkie and victim of a continual flop sweat, crouches before their image, masterfully controlling a surveillance camera with a joystick in his left hand. He is flanked by FBI men. Livingston's been doing freelance surveillance for the late for the FBI mod squad. How are his nerves? Oh, okay. Uh, not so bad you'd notice. As an FBI man reaches to adjust a monitor. Don't, don't, don't touch it. Do you see me pulling the gun out of your holster and firing it? Hey, Radio Shack, relax. Exterior Santa Monica boardwalk later. Livingston walks down the boardwalk. A rollerblader with a dog on a leash approaches and Livingston gets caught between the two. As he struggles to untangle himself from the leash, interior cafe with a view of Livingston on the boardwalk, Danny and Rusty wait for him over espressos. What about munitions? Bill Turrentine. Hmm. Dead. No shit, on the job? Sun cancer. You send flowers? No, nah. dated his wife for a while. Mm. Vasher? We may be too late. Interior bank, close on Vasher Tar, night. The explosives expert, a pair of goggles over his eyes reflects a match being struck, then touched to a fuse. Ooh. Oh, fucking hell. You guys had one job to do. Exterior bank one minute later, the men exit through the front doors, their hands over their heads, Basher trailing them. Policemen and SWAT members encircled the group, weapons trained on them, chock full of instructions. Exterior police car later, Basher sits in the rear, handcuffed behind his back, feet on the pavement. An explosives cop kneels in front of him. And that's all you use during the event? Nothing else? Hold on in. You're accusing me of booby trapping. Well, how about it? Booby traps aren't exactly Mr. Ta's style. <laughs> Isn't that right? Basher. Uh, Peck, ATF. Let me venture a guess. A simple G4 mainliner, double coil, backwound, quick fuse with a drag under 20 feet? Hmm. That's all, man. Now, now tell me something else. Have you checked him for booby traps on his person? I, and I mean really check, not, not just for weapons. The cop looks bewildered. Rusty steps forward, yanks Basher onto his feet, spins him around. He moves his hands up and down Basher's legs, around his waist, under his arms. Now, will you go find Griggs and tell him I need to see him? Who? Just go find him, will ya? Hey, Vasher, how fast can you put something together with what I passed you? Uh, from when? No. Moving with Rusty and Basher. They're hurrying. Ahead of them is a wall of squad cars, a police cordon, and a crowd of onlookers. 10 seconds? Not quite. Hey, is Danny here? Right in the corner. Oh, brilliant. It'd be good to work with proper villains again. Okay, go. They both start running. Everybody down, get down, there's a bomb in the... <laughs> and behind them, the squad car erupts with a bang. A collective scream rises from the crowd, everyone ducks. Cops hit the ground and cover their heads. Rusty and Basher move briskly past them, dodging their splayed legs like tires on the obstacle course. By the time the explosives cop thinks to look around for Basher, they've both disappeared. Interior, under the big top, day. The Chinese National Circus currently on tour in the Western United States. Trapeze artists, gymnastics teams, and trampoline daredevils fly, somersault, spin, and swing through the air. A full house applauds very, uh, every feet. Danny and Rusty sit in the bleachers, surrounded by parents and kids, munching on spindles of cotton candy. Tough guys in Toyland. Introducing the amazing Yen. A funambulist begins his high wire act. This is Yen. So he can walk on a rope? Yeah, a little more than that. So he can juggle. We need a grease man, not an acrobat. Who else is on this list? He is the list. 
who else would you just watch halfway across the wire yen sits and very slowly but without hesitation he contorts himself into a ball never losing his balance even danny is impressed hmm. there's your grease man exterior santa monica pier parking lot day danny and rusty exit the circus tent heading for their cars we need saul hmm. he won't come he swore off the game a year ago he get religion ulcers you can ask him i can ask exterior dog track betting window in miami florida day saul bloom 50s befuddled wearing a corduroy jacket patched at the elbows and a duffer's hat counts out money through the window lists his bets he checks his tickets plunges them into his pants pocket and moves off through the track lobby rusty appears in the foreground behind a pillar as dapper as saul is down at heel watching him go when saul disappears into the tunnel he moves in the infield saul sits on one of the long general admission steps under the box seats he produces an orange from his pocket, starts to peel it. A pair of well-shined shoes appears behind him. Saul senses their presence, but doesn't look around. Uh, doesn't turn around. I saw you in the paddock before the second race outside the men's room when I placed my bet. I saw you before you even got up this morning. How you been, Sal? Never better. What's with the orange? My doctor says I need vitamins. So why don't you just take some vitamins? You come here to give me a physical? Hmm. I got a box seat. Come on. Hmm. Exterior box seats later. A waiter serves coffee to Rusty and Saul. I thought you drank Bloody Marys off the track, Saul. A man shouldn't drink on the job. So, who are we rooting for here? Number four. There's the bell. The electronic rabbit is released and the dogs break out of the gate. From this point on, Saul's eyes never leave the race. You gonna ask me? Or should I just say no and get it over with? Saul, you're the best there is. You're in Cooperstown. What do you want? Nothing. I got a duplex now. I got wall to wall on a goldfish. I'm seeing a nice lady. She works the unmentionable counter at Macy's. I've changed. Uh -uh. Guys like us don't change. We stay sharp or we get sloppy, but we get slim. Quick con in me. Uh, that your hound way in the back? He breaks late. Everyone knows this. Mm. You gonna treat me like a grown up at least? Tell me what the scam is? Under the noise, Rusty leans in and whispers in Saul's ear. Saul's eyes widen, then glaze over as all around him people are standing and shouting. Rusty places an envelope in Saul's lap, then gets up and walks out as on the track, the number four dog crosses the finish line, last by a lot. Saul considers his options. In one hand, a fan of losing tickets. In the other, courtesy of Rusty, a ticket to Vegas. And Saul makes 10. Interior bar night. Danny and Rusty look weary from all this recruitment. A nearby TV with the sound off plays a promo for an upcoming Tyson fight. 10 should do it, don't you think? Huh. You think we need one more? You think we need one more? Okay, we'll get one more. Interior crowded subway car in Chicago. Native Chicagoans demonstrate their indigenous sixth sense, El Car balance, as the train bends and shakes at a corner. One passenger in particular keeps his footing, a young man in a frayed jacket, his name is Linus. Two overgroomed stockbrokers stand with their backs to the young man, yammering about high interest yields, and consequently they, consequently they don't notice, and neither do we, not at first, that Linus is slowly picking one of their pockets. The thievery is glacier paced. Linus is face always forward and inscrutable, Gingerly raises one tail of his target's Brooks Brothers jacket and then, with incomparable dexterity, unbuttons his wallet pocket with a flick of his thumb and forefinger. From halfway down the train car, nothing appears amiss, and no passenger looks the wiser, or so it seems. A copy of the Chicago Sun-Times, opened and upheld, lowers just enough to allow its reader a peek at Linus. It's Danny, with a smirk on his lips. He, and he alone, is aware of the ongoing heist. Back to Linus, his spoils, a Gucci wallet, now in sight, but he waits for just the right moment. And then, when the train hits another curve, he stumbles forward, his left hand finding support on the stockbroker's shoulder as his right relieves the man of his wallet. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. The stockbroker resumes his yakking, oblivious, as Linus turns a tux's prize into his own jacket pocket, face betraying nothing. Only Danny appreciates the artistry performed here today. He folds the Sun Times under his arm as the subway squeals to a stop. Linus jumps out, leaving his prey aboard, and a few moments later, Danny steps off too. Interior, Union Station, evening. The hurly-burly of rush hour in Union Station. 
Commuters zig and zag this way and that, all on furious schedules, and Linus slips blithely among them. In no hurry, a man who's pulled this job a thousand times before. He dodges and sidesteps crazed commuters, and except for a brief brush with one well-dressed man, the Sun Times tucked under his arm, he escapes the station without incident. Exterior, Union Station, evening. Linus exits, casually reaching into his jacket to count his winnings, and his face falls. All he can find where the stolen wallet, stolen wallet once was, resided, uh, st stolen wallet, Jesus, where, all he can find where the stolen wallet once resided is a calling card. On one side, an engraved printing, Daniel Ocean. On the flip side, in handwriting, nice pull, Murphy's Bar, rushed and division. Interior, Murphy's Bar, five minutes later. On a tabletop, the Gucci wallet beside a half-drunk Guinness. Linus enters the front door, cases the joint, spots the wallet on the table, and Danny behind it. Hi, Linus. Sit down. Who are you? Sit down. A friend of Bobby Caldwell's. Sit down. Linus balks, prideful, but sense finds a way, and he sits. Bobby told me about you, said you were the best set of hands he ever saw. Didn't expect he'd find you working wallets on the subway. That wasn't work, that was practice. You're either yeah. in or out, right now. What is it? A plane ticket, a job offer. You're pretty trusting pretty fast. Bobby has every faith in you. <laughs> Fathers are like that. Oh, he didn't tell you. He doesn't like me trading on his name. We do this job, he'll be trading on yours. What if I say no? We'll get someone else who won't be quite as good. You can go back to feeling up stockbrokers. A waitress passes and Danny signals for her for the bill. While his attention returns to Linus, the wallet remains, but the ticket beneath his hand is gone. Linus is reading it. That's the best lift I've seen you make yet. Las Vegas, huh? America's playground. And our main theme kicks in as we... Las Vegas, aerial view, establishing dusk. The city looms out of the desert like an infernal machine, lights flashing, skyline pulsing, a neon fortress. One thing in particular catches our eye, an enormous billboard with an ad for the upcoming boxing match between Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis. Below it, a promoter hands out flyers for strip joints and call girls. Interior, Ruben Tishkoff's mansion, Las Vegas, night. Frank Catton is already here mixing a drink when, ding dong, the doorbell chimes. Tishkoff shuffles towards the door and opens his door to find Rick a treat. Livingston, Basher, Yen, the Malloys, Saul, and Linus crowding his doormat. doormat. A taxi van pulls away behind them. What, you guys get a group right or something? Interior Tishkoff's living room later. Along one wall, a buffet table has been set up, and while Virgil and Turk pile shrimp onto plates, Saul pockets an orange for later. So, uh, you make it out to Utah much, Saul? Not as much as I'd like. Hmm. You should. You'd like it. I like football. football. At the wet bar, Basher mixes a drink for Livingston. On a couch, Yen balances coffee table ornaments into a sky skyscraper to Frank's astonishment. In a corner, off on his own, Linus watches the company, his eyes narrowing, wary, until... Gentlemen. Welcome to Las Vegas. Everybody eaten? Good. Everybody sober? Close enough. Most of you know each other already. You probably haven't met Linus Caldwell before. He's Bobby's kid out of Chicago. Okay, before we start, nobody's on the line here yet. What I'm about to propose to you happens to be both highly lucrative and highly dangerous. If that doesn't sound like your particular brand of vodka, help yourself to as much food as you like. Safe journey, no hard feelings. Otherwise, come with me. He turns and walks out of the living room into another. Rusty is close behind. He turns briefly, casts an eye over the assembled, and keeps going. The guys look each other over, sizing things up. What the hell? And he follows, along with Frank and Livingston, then Virgil, Turk, and Yen, then Saul. That leaves Linus watching the line of men disappear. He turns to find Tishkoff by his side, staring at him. Hi. You're Bobby Caldwell's kid, huh? Yeah. From Chicago? It's nice there. You like it? Yeah. That's wonderful. Get in the goddamn room. 
Interior game room. A tournament level pool table holds center stage here. Atop its green felt sits a raised elaborate miniature of Terry Benedict's Las Vegas. Three casinos and hotels with a strip running between them. As the 11 surround the table and the model. Gentlemen, the 14,000 block of Las Vegas Boulevard, otherwise known as the Bellagio, the Mirage, the MGM Grand. Together, they're the three most profitable casinos in Las Vegas. Gentlemen, the Bellagio Vault. Located below the strip, beneath 200 feet of solid earth, it safeguards every dime that comes through each of the three casinos above it. And we're gonna rob it. Smash and grab job, huh? It's um, a little more complicated than that. Yeah. Courtesy of Frank Catton, new blackjack dealer at the Bellagio, security tape from the three casinos. On the monitors, we see three montages of black and white security tapes, starting within the three casinos' cages, moving into the tunnels, then, as the TVs unite in their images, pushing into the elevator and eventually the vault. As the group's glances shoot back and forth from the TV to the corresponding section of the model, i.e. from a POV of the tunnel to the miniature tunnel itself. Okay, bad news first. The place houses a security system which rivals most nuclear missile silos. First, we have to get within the casino cages. Here, here, and here which anyone knows takes more than a smile. Next, through these doors, each of which requires a different six digit code changed every 12 hours. Past those lies the elevator, and this is where it gets tricky. The elevator won't move without authorized fingerprint identifications. Which we cannot fake. And vocal confirmations from both the security center within the Bellagio and the vault below. Which we will not get. Furthermore, the elevator shaft is rigged with motion detectors. Meaning if we manually override the lift, the shaft's exit will lock down automatically and we'll be trapped. Once we've gotten down the shaft though, then it's just a walk in the park. Past three more guards with Uzis and predilections toward not being robbed and the most elaborate vault door conceived by man. Any questions? Silence. For a moment, each man keeps his two dozen questions or more to himself. At last, one speaks up. The amazing Yen in Cantonese. No one understands him except Rusty. No, tunneling's out. Their Richter scale is monitoring the ground for 100 yards in every direction. If a groundhog tried to nest there, they'd know about it. Anybody else? Another silence. Uh, you said something about good news? Mm. The Nevada Gaming Commission stipulates a casino must hold in reserve enough cash to cover every chip in play on its floor. As I mentioned, this vault services each of the three casinos above it. That means during the week, by law, it must hold anywhere from 60 to $70 million in cash and coin on a weekend between 80 and 90 million. On a fight night, like the one two weeks from tonight, the night we're gonna rob it, at least 150 million without breaking a sweat. Now, there are 11 of us, each with an equal share. You do the math. Moving around the table on 10 faces, as everyone does precisely that in their heads, except for Virgil, who does it on his fingers. He whistles. Yeah, that's what I said. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Say we do get into the cage and through the security doors there and down the elevator we can't move and past the guards with guns and into the vault we can't open. Oh, yeah, without being seen by the cameras. Oh, right, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, say we do all that. We're just supposed to walk out of there with a hundred million dollars in cash on us without getting stopped. Yeah. All right, we how we'll begin. Interior MGM Grand Casino day, moving with a cash cart as security guards push it past tourists, past cocktail waitresses, past Linus sitting at a blackjack table. First task, reconnaissance. I want to know everything that's going on in all three casinos, from the rotation of the dealers to the path of every cash cart. Interior Bellagio break room day. Two security technicians on a smoke break grumble about their sex, sex lives. Across the room, Frank sits innocently doing a crossword. I want to know everything about every guard, every watcher, anyone with a security pass. I want to know where they're from, what their nicknames are, how they take their coffee. Better View reveals on his crossword, Frank has scribbled a transcript of the technician's conversation as he glances up at an electronic key card clipped to one technician's belt. Interior Mirage Casino Day, an identical key card is swiped through a keypad. It's light flashing red to green, admitting a guard into an employee's only doorway. 
The Malloys, who've shadowed the guard here, note a sentry standing watch by the door, as well as a security camera embedded in the ceiling above. No one walks through that portal unchecked. Most of all, I want you guys to know these casinos. They were built as labyrinths to keep people in. I want you to know the quick routes out. Their job done, the Malloys start toward the casino's exit in different directions. They begin to argue, the exit's this way. No, it's that way. Exterior Las Vegas Boulevard, outside three casinos, day. With two dozen other tourists, Basher crosses the street, and when he meets a manhole cover, he stops and, extracting a small metal hook from his jacket, removes it from its perch, so casual about the action that no passerby looks twice at him. Second test, power. On the night of the fight, we're going to throw the switch on Sin City. Basher, it's your show. Basher drops into the hole, pulling the cover over him as we pull up over the Bellagio and dissolve to interior Bellagio Security Center, eye in the sky. Dozens of monitors manned by dozens of watchers canvas dozens of casino tables. Only NASA's control rooms house more technology. Apart from the fray, another bank of monitors manned by two watchers oversee a different section of the casino, the cage, its tunnels, the elevator, and the vault it leads to. Everything, in fact, which our team saw in the game room. Third task, surveillance. Casino security has an eye and an ear on everything, so one an eye and an ear on them. Livingston? Interior, Bellagio, Livingston's room. Close on set of schematics of Bellagio, night. A page of the set Danny and Rusty borrowed from the architects. Danny and Livingston study it. Well, it's not the least accessible system I've seen, but it's close. I don't suppose they have a closed circuit feed I could tap into? Then this is definitely a black bag job. Do they employ an in-house technician? Two, and one of them is lonely. Dance music overwhelms the soundtrack as we go to a strip club at night, as we join a lap dance already in progress. A security technician, one of the two Frank eavesdropped on in the break room, shells out 20 bucks every three minutes to a dancer. And while the technician grins not very soberly, the dancer secretly removes the key card from his belt. I'll be right back, honey. Don't move a muscle. Depends on the muscle. She pouts flirtingly as she does for every idiot who drops a line like that, then makes her way to exterior of the strip club where Rusty waits for her. And when she slips him the key card, he slips her a C note. Thanks, Charmaine. I'll have it back within the hour. Mm. Say hello to your mom for me. Say it yourself. She'll be on stage in five minutes. Interior Bellagio Casino night. Following a bunch of balloons, all congratulating happy anniversary as a delivery boy carries them through the casino. And just as he's passing an employee's only door, complete with sentry and embedded ceiling camera, he bumps into a tourist and the balloons drift out of his hand and into the camera. Hey, you watch it, bud. Interior Bellagio Security Center, eye in the sky as the balloons fill the frame of one monitor. 433, we have a visual impairment on the East Store camera. Interior Bellagio Casino by Cage Door Night. The Sentry 433 hears this and spots the balloons covering the embedded camera and approaches the delivery boy, who by freak accident happens to be Virgil Malloy. Excuse me, sir, you're gonna have to move those balloons. Who you calling er Bud, pal? Who you calling pal, friend? Who you calling friend? Bud. And with the sentry out of position, Livingston, dressed now in a technician's uniform, don't worry about how he got it, goes quickly to the door and swipes the newly acquired key card. And when it flashes red to green, he enters the cage. He's in. Livingston takes a moment, his brow perspiring. He's in the lion's den now. Then checks his palm. Drawn there in ballpoint is a diagram of the cage corridors. Interior, interior, Bellagio Security Center, eye in the sky, on monitor, next to balloon, clouded one. Livingston appears and, as nonchalantly as he can, ambles down a hallway, then another, until he reaches an unmarked door next to the entrance to the security center. Livingston swipes his key card to enter, a giant walk-in closet slash switchboard full of wires, plugs, lights, etc. He goes to work. Montage, he splices all sorts of wires and lines and cables. Meanwhile, interior Bellagio Casino by cage door, night. Virgil and Turk argue nose to nose, accidentally blocking the sentry from the balloons. You hear about this new medical discovery they made? It's called the sense of direction. Apparently we're all supposed to have one. Yeah, 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 whatever little balloon boy bitch. You look like gentlemen, you're- Gentlemen, gentlemen. Interior circuitry room. Livingston work here is almost done. He clips a small mechanism known in his industry as a spider to a main conduit, then verifies a tiny receiver he holds is picking up the spider's feed. One last click into place causes a brief unnoticed blip on the monitors. 
back in his room, or sorry, interior Bellagio, Livingston's room night and transmits all the views of the cages on, into the monitors upstairs. Danny and Rusty witness their appearance. Why do they paint the hallways that color? You know, they say taupe is very soothing. Mm -hmm. Interior cage hallway. Livingston steps outside. His job done, he exhales and wipes the sweat from his brow and checks his palm for directions. And whoops, his sweat just smeared the ballpoint. He's flying blind. He looks left down a corridor, then right, trying to remember which way he came from. No clue. Uh -oh. Interior, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we're moving with Livingston as he tries to find his way out. He takes a left. Whoops again. Here comes a security guard, dead ahead. Livingston has no recourse but to march right by him. Hiya. Fine, thanks. Hey. Meanwhile, at last, the sentry outmaneuvers Virgil and Turk and grabs the balloons himself. Virgil quickly snatches them back. Interior cage hallway. Livingston approaches the exit's keep. Balloons. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Do it. I did. Virgil, do it. No, we want to hear. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Interior cage hallway. Livingston approaches the exit's keypad and swipes his key card. The light does not flash red to green. Hey. He looks. He swiped the wrong side of the card. He tries again. Red to green. He pulls the door, but the guard blocks it. Meanwhile, Danny and Rusty simultaneously lean forward. Back in the cage. You dropped this. Thanks. And he's out. Interior Bellagio, Livingston Suite, night. Danny and Rusty exhale. Well, <sighs> yeah. All right, fourth task, construction. Interior warehouse day. The gang hauls building materials, lumber, tools, paint, etc. And Yen hauls three times his share, carrying objects on his head, shoulders, arms, a circus act in a hardware store. We need to build an exact working replica of the Bellagio vault. It's um, for practice. Yeah, something like that. Fifth task, intelligence. We need those codes, Linus, from the only man who has all three. Benedict. Learn to love his shadow. Six tasks, transport. Wait, wait, all I get to do is watch him? For now, you gotta walk before you crawl. Um, just reverse that, guys. Sure, sure. Six tasks, transport. Exterior, Billy Tim's van and truck dealership, day. Outside a window, Turk and Virgil jump up and down on opposite bumpers of a van, testing its durability. Inside, Frank negotiates with Billy Tim, a Cal Worthington-esque redneck car dealer who half pays attention to him, half threats over the Malloys outside. Um, I'm sorry, 18.5 is the best I can offer. I can make you. Oh, oh, hey. Uh, oh, I understand perfectly. They are beautiful vans. Well, I thank you for your time, Mr. Uh, Denim, Billy Denim. Yes, Denim, like a jean. You know, you have lovely hands. Do you moisturize? Um, I'm sorry. I swear by it. I try all sorts of lotions. I went through a fragrance free period last year, but now I'm liking this brand fortified with rose hip. My sister, you know, she uses the aloe vera with the sunscreen built in. Uh-huh, um, and you said you'd be willing to pay in cash? I did. You know, they say cinnamon is wonderful for your pores. Read that on the internet. And that ideally you should be wearing gloves to bed, but I find that wouldn't interfere with my social agenda. Problem is I get a reaction to camper, so I can't use traditional memories, me remedies. Uh-huh, if you could pay cash, I could probably drop the price a little to say, uh. 17, 16. That would be lovely, yeah. Interior warehouse, back to Danny. Overseeing the construction, reviewing his list of tasks on his fingers, suspecting he's missed one. Power surveillance transport. Anything I can do. Yeah, get your wallet. 
Interior haberdashery, a tailor fits Saul for the finest suits Tishkoff's money can buy, as Saul smooths out a coat sleeve. This is nice material. It's Armani, Saul. It's very nice. <sighs> Saul's not fooling anyone. He's scared, right down to his floor shines. Danny calls, uh, nods to the tailor. Give us a moment. Saul, are you sure you're ready to do this? If you question me again, Daniel, you won't wake up the following morning. You're ready. Danny signals Tishkoff, let's pay, and Saul immediately slumps into his old self. To a mirror, he practices. Hello, my name is Lyman Zerka. <clears throat> my name is Lyman Zerka. Interior limousine day. Saul's dressed completely and immaculately. Now in Armani, with his hair slicked back, a brief mustache on his lip, and impenetrably dark glasses riding the bridge of his nose. He continues to practice his accent even deeper now and specifying no geographic origin. My name is Lyman Zerga. My name is Lyman Zerga. My name is Lyman Zerga. There's a little over 20 grand in there, Saul. Try to make it last. You've seen my, uh, my, uh, Brought you a fresh roll. Yeah. The limo pulls to a stop and outside there is a flurry of footsteps before Saul's door swings open and Turk and Virgil, both costumes, costumed as bodyguards, stand waiting for him. Mr. Zerga, we're here. Good luck, Lyman. Luck is for losers. Interior Bellagio Casino Day. Saul, as Lyman Zerga, makes as low profile an entrance into the Bellagio as he can with bodyguards preceding and trailing him. He approaches a VIP concierge. Good afternoon, sir. How can I be of service? My name is Lyman Zerga. I'd like a suite, please. Okay, do you have a reservation with us? I don't make reservations. Interior, outside restaurant's entrance day. Outside a restaurant's entrance, Rusty and Linus sit before two slot machines, idly dropping quarters in as they watch Saul receive the royal treatment. Okay, now tell me about Benedict. Guy's a machine. Exterior, Bellagio Casino Day, super slow motion. Terry Benedict emerges from a town car and from his haircut to his smile to his pant cuffs, he is effortless perfection. He is Vegas royalty, yet he denies eye contact to no man. He strides into his casino and appearing behind a pillar, Linus follows him in. He arrives at the Bellagio every day at 2 p.m. Same town car, same driver. Remembers every valet's name on the way in. Not bad for a guy worth three quarters of a billion. Interior Bellagio elevator bay, super slow motion. The doors open and Terry Benedict steps out. Linus watches from a craps table. Offices are upstairs. He works hard, hits the lobby floor at seven on the nose. Interior Bellagio casino night, super slow motion. From a balcony, Benedict stands overlooking the casino floor. His casino manager approaches and they confer. Spends three minutes on the floor with his casino manager. What do they talk about? All business. Benedict likes to know what's going on in his casinos. There's rarely an incident he doesn't know about or handle personally. Interior high rollers room, super slow motion. Benedict works the room. He speaks to a Japanese high roller in Japanese, to a Swiss in German, etc. He spends a few minutes glad handling the high rollers. He's went in Spanish, German, and Italian, and he's taking Japanese lessons. He's getting pretty good at it. He's out by 7.30 when an assistant hands him a black portfolio. Contents, the day's take, and new security codes. Then he heads to the restaurant. Indeed, as Benedict makes his exit, an assistant hands him a black portfolio. Interior Bellagio Casino, outside the restaurant. Rusty and Linus watch the entrance. No one enters. Give him another 10 seconds. Around the corner comes Benedict, carrying his black portfolio. As I said, a machine. All right, and that portfolio contains the codes to all the cage doors? Two minutes after they've been changed, he's got them in hand. I'll tell you. The guys picked a, you guys picked a hell of a target. He's as smart and ruthless as they come. The last guy he caught cheating in here, Benedict not only set him up for 10 years, he got the bank to seize the guy's home and bankrupted his- brother in laws tractor dealership. We've all heard it. He doesn't just go after your knees. He goes after your livelihood and everyone you've ever met's livelihood. Are you scared? Suicidal. Only in the morning. Now what? Now comes the girl. 
If she comes in after he does, that means they're in a snit. Where does she come from? The museum downstairs. She's the curator there. Wait. <clears throat> You'll like this. Best part of my day. Rusty looks up as a beautiful woman, the one Danny saw on Benedict's arm in the New York Times photo appears. Elegantly dressed, a knockout. She moves very much in her own private space and Rusty's face just about drops at the sight of her. I don't know if we can use her yet. I haven't even caught her name. Tess. What? Her name is Tess. Exterior warehouse night. Construction continues into the wee hours. Interior warehouse night. A facsimile of the Bellagio vault sprouts into shape. Livingston fixes a security camera in a corner, then matches its image of Frank staple gunning floorboard into place to a security tape of the real McCoy. On the other side of the garage, Turk and Virgil go to work on their newly purchased bands with wrenches and blowtorches. Tishkoff recognizes a gasket Virgil handles. <coughs> this looks familiar. Where'd you get this? Off your rolls. Danny, tell him not to touch the rolls. Overlooking the whole enterprise is Danny, grinning from ear to ear, happy in his work. He checks a stopwatch in his hand as the false top to the cash cart before him flies open, revealing Yen within, his arms, legs, and torso folded into a three by four foot space. He whips an air hose from his mouth and inhales deeply. Danny checks his watch. Uh, 2947, everything okay in there? Yen responds, of course, Danny doesn't understand him, but Rusty does, appearing behind him. Yeah, but what doesn't beat the shit out of being a circus performer? Exterior warehouse night. Danny and Rusty adjourn from the warehouse. What is it? Tell me this isn't about her, or I'll walk up the job right now. Tess, she's with Terry Benedict. Now tell me this isn't about screwing the guy who's screwing your wife. Ex-wife. Tell me. It's not about that entirely. You said you needed a reason. Well, this is mine. When we started in this business, we had three rules. We weren't gonna hurt anybody. We weren't gonna steal from anybody that didn't have it coming. And we weren't gonna play, and we were gonna play the game like we had nothing to lose. Well, I lost something, someone. That's why I'm here. Okay, here's the problem. We're stealing two things now. And when push comes to shove, if you can't have both, which are you gonna choose? And, and remember, Tess doesn't divide 11 ways. If things go to plan, I won't be the one who has to make that choice. How did she look, by the way? Tess, I've seen her happier. Close on Picasso's woman with guitar. Radiant is the word, absolutely radiant. Interior Bellagio Art Gallery, day. The painting hangs under a portrait lamp on a wall between a Van Gogh and a Monet. At a distance, admiring it are Tess, the seller, and the seller's aide de camp, a staff photographer and other personnel mill nearby. Off to the side in a sharp blazer, Tess stands transfixed by the painting. He painted it in the summer of 1912 after the breakup with Ferdinand Oliver. <laughs> she must have put him through hell. <laughs> you can see the conflict. He makes her both erotic and grotesque. He's hopelessly drawn to her. And yet, she drives him crazy. Uh, Mr. Santaniello uh, has an early flight. Do you think Mr. Benedict will be late? Mr. Benedict is never late. Just then, the double doors to the gallery swing open and Terry Benedict enters right on time. He is elegant, beaming, commanding. All that's missing is a blare of trumpets. Am I late? Not at all, Mr. Benedict. Allow me to introduce you to Mr. Gene Santiello. Mr. Santaniello, I apologize if I kept you. I had to iron out a few issues with my fight promoter. I gave him an unlimited budget and he exceeded it. I understand it's gonna be a hell of a fight. We hope. Um. Here it is. Magnificent. I've been following her for 15 years now. 
at last I've made her a home. All the arrangements and so forth. Done. She's yours. Not mine. She belongs to everyone who comes into my hotel. Isn't that right, Miss Osher? Yes, Mr. Benedict. She's lovely, isn't she? I can't be the only one who is after her. Well, you're the only one who met my price. Uh, but this, you can't put a price on beauty. But I shouldn't philosophize. I own casinos, after all. Can we get a quick shot? Mr. Santaniello has a plane to catch. Of course, of course. Tess understands she is not to be part of the photo. Benedict and the seller pose together and flash. Interior Bellagio Art Gallery later. The seller exits with the aide de camp in tow. Benedict remains enthralled by the painting. Tess appears beside him. You like it? I like that you like it. I have some bad news from the world of high fashion. It seems Mike Tyson will be wearing red on Saturday nights. Red trunks with a white stripe. Oh. And you, as I recall, will be wearing a red Donna Karen. And when the TV cameras pick us up in the front row, that red dress. I see. He's a charming man, but no one, no one's going to be watching him when they can make a study of you. I've asked Paolo to find three or four things for you to try. I hope you're not too disappointed. Are you sure? <laughs> I'll see you tonight. Instinctively, she leans in to kiss him. He recoils ever so slightly. What? We're alone. He lets his eye wander. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. He lets his eye wander along the length of the ceiling over all the eye in the sky cameras hidden there. She follows his look. In my hotels, there's always someone watching. But he kisses her anyway. I'll see you tonight. Actually, I do like it. And Tess remains thinking, he's rich, he's handsome and wooing, but is she happy? Interior, high rollers room, night. Quiet, elegant, tense. One table is operating only in the corner and at it, Saul as Lyman Zerga furtively peels at the roll of roll aids and slips one in his mouth. Weak stomach, eh, Mr. Zerga? I don't believe in weakness. It costs too much. I don't believe in questions either. This shuts the high roller up fast. Saul looks up from the table just perceptibly to spot Terry Benedict on his way in, right on schedule. He approaches the pit boss by the entrance. Eddie, anything for me? Mr. Zerga, sir, Lyman Zerga, in the third position, wishes to speak with you privately. Who is he? Businessman of some kind, working mostly in Europe. He's very big, but I asked around. Where it is he deals primarily in arms, one of the biggest. There we go. Never heard of him. Yes, sir. That's why I don't doubt it. He's staying here? Checked in two nights ago, sir. He's in the Mirador suite. How's he doing? Up. Almost 40 grand. Good for him. Interior Bellagio restaurant, same time. Tess Ocean sits in a booth and sips at a glass of wine and checks her watch. Benedict is late or very close to being so when a pair of hands slips over her shoulders and starts to caress her arms. You're 30 seconds late. I was about to send off the search party. Danny. Hello, Tess. What are you doing here? I'm out. You're out. Of prison. You remember the day I went for cigarettes and never came back? You must have noticed. I don't smoke. Don't sit. They said I paid my dues and debt to society. Funny, I never got a check. It's good to see you. You can't sit. You're not wearing your ring. I sold it and I don't have a husband. Or didn't you get the papers? My last day inside. I told you I'd write. Danny, go now before- Benedict. She freezes, Danny knows, he smiles, it's okay. Then to a passing waiter. Uh, whiskey and 
Danny. You're doing a great job curating the museum. The Vermeer is quite good, simple, but vibrant. Although his work definitely fell off as he got older. Remind you of anyone? And I still get Monet and Manet confused. Which one married his mistress? Monet. Right, Manet had syphilis. They also painted occasionally. You don't know how many times I played this conversation out in my head the last two years. Did, all, did it always go this poorly? Yes. Sounds frustrating. Uh, you were never easy. <laughs> okay, I'll make this quick. I came here for you. I'm gonna get on with my life and I want you with me. You're a thief and a liar. I only lied about being a thief, but I don't do that anymore. Steal? Lie. I'm with someone who doesn't have to make that kind of distinction. No, he's very clear on both. Nice. Work on that for two years, did you? A year and a half. You know what your problem is? I only have one. You met too many people like you. I'm with Terry now. Mm. Does he make you laugh? He doesn't make me cry. Interior, high rollers room, same time. At the table, Saul bets heavily for the bank. Benedict approaches, stands off to the right, watching. Sorry. Oof, you don't want to get in the hole too heavy with this Benedict. Friend of mine once borrowed 100 Gs from the guy. Two months went by. Benedict hadn't heard from him. He calls up my friend. He is where was my money. I'll get to it when I get to it, my friend says. Half an hour later, Benedict's in my friend's hotel room, dangling him off his 10th floor balcony by his feet. You gonna get it now? High roller turns over a nine. Saul wins. Bank wins, natural nine. Hiya, Terry. Mr. Wantrop, how's everything? Ah, they put too much grenadine in my Shirley Temple. And here I thought you were drinking vodka. Mr. Zerga? Mr. Benedict, I recognize you from the TV. You know, nine casinos out of 10 owner comes up in the middle of the hand to ask me what I want. I respect your waiting. You're the guest, sir. And I have to impose on your hospitality. Can you sit in for a hand? I'd love to, Mr. Zerga, but the gaming board would feed me to my white tigers. That's a shame. You're the king of Vegas and you have to play craps on the alley. No shame at all. Reminds me of my youth. A moment later, Benedict and Saul are huddled in a corner. The fight is Saturday, is it not? Yes, I can get you seats. No, no, hand-to-hand -hand combat doesn't interest me. I have a package arriving here Saturday evening, a black briefcase, standard size, the contents of which are very valuable to me. I'd be happy to put it in the house safe for you. The house safe is for Brandy and Grandmother's pearls. I'm afraid I need something more secure. I can assure you the house safe is utterly- I can assure you, Mr. Benedict, your generosity in this matter will not go overlooked. Now, what can you offer me besides the safe? Interior Bellagio restaurant, same time. See, the kind of people you steal things from they have insurance to compensate them. They get made whole again. And I had to leave New York to get away from what happened. How do I get my five years back, Danny? You can't, but what you can do is not throw away another five years. You don't know anything about- Listen, you're not in love with me anymore. You wanna make a life with someone else, fine. I'll have to live with that, but not him. Spoken like a true ex-husband. I'm not joking, Tess. I'm not laughing. You have to admit there's some conflict of interest when you give me advice about my love life. Yes, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Do you remember when, what I said to you when we first met? You said you better know what you're doing. Do you? Now? Because truly you should walk out the door if you don't. I know what I'm doing. What are you doing? Catching up. Terry, meet my ex-husband. Danny Ocean. 
Mr. Ocean. Forgive me for being late. A guest required my attention. Danny was just walking through the restaurant and spotted me. Is that right? I was shocked myself. Imagine the odds. Of all the gin joints in all the world. You've been in prison until recently, isn't that right? How does it feel to be out? Uh, about the same. Everything you want is still on the other side. There's the human condition for you. Terry, Danny was just about to... I just wanted to say hello. For old time's sake. Stay for a drink, if you like. I can't. He can't. Well, then I don't imagine we'll be seeing you again, Mr. Ocean. You never know. I know everything that happens in my hotels. Oh, so I should put those towels back then. The towels you can keep. It was good seeing you, Tess. Take care, Danny. Danny exits. I'm sorry. Don't be. Outside the restaurant, moving with Danny as he exits, his fingers snapping. He saw the mist in Tess's eyes just now. He knows he's got a fighting chance with her, but what he does not know is Linus is tailing him, ten steps back. He stops, glances back at the restaurant quizzically, then continues following Danny. Interior, Basher Tars Hotel Room Day. Nobody lights a match. This place is a powder keg. Basher sits on his bed, surrounded by combustibles, whittling and polishing a plastic explosive into an emerald shape. There's a knock at the door. Uh, just jumping into the shower, love. Can you come back later? On TV, a reporter broadcasts live. We're here at the historic Paradiso Hotel and Casino, once the prize resort of Las Vegas, now seconds away from demolition. Got it. Exterior Paradiso Hotel on the Strip Day. Just down the block from the Terry Benedict Trinity stands, for a few remaining moments, the edifice of the Paradiso, Ruben Tishkoff's bankrupted hotel casino. A crowd is gathered to witness its destruction. Terry Benedict, for one, his finger on the button and his face in the spotlight. Tess, another, standing near by her man. Danny, too, hidden within the masses, eyes fixed on his ex, and Linus, who keeps a steady bead on Danny. And here's Ruben Tishkoff, former owner of the Paradiso, come to bid farewell to his fabled resort and wish Terry Benedict all the best for his future plans for the property. Terry greets Ruben before the TV cameras and newspaper reporters and everyone smiling and shaking hands, but behind those smiles and under those breaths. Good to see you. So shit in your mouth. <laughs> Tess, her eyes roaming the crowd, finds a pair staring back at her, Danny's. She holds his glance a moment, long enough for both Linus and Benedict to notice before turning away to Benedict, who puts his public smile back on and steps up to a podium alongside Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis. And together, they all put their hands on the plunger, and Benedict leans into a microphone. I hope there's as much dynamite in the Paradiso as there will be in this Saturday's fight. And whoosh, the plunger comes down, and right your own onomatopoeia here, the Paradiso implodes. Ruben wipes a tear from his eye. Goodbye, honey. Interior, Basher Tars Hotel Room, same time. As the Paradiso crumbles outside his window, the lights and TV in his room flicker and go out. As he scrambles out the door, making sure to post a do not disturb sign. All right, Saturday is yours. Do whatever you like with that. We're in Tishkoff's game room at night. From above, slowly descending, 10 of our 11, Basher is missing, surround the model of the three casinos. Rusty leads everyone in a rundown of the heist. All right, so call is at 5.30, makeup and costume. Saul's package arrives at 7.15, and Linus grabs our coats. All goes well there, and we're a go. 7.30, Virgil and Turk deliver Yen, and then we're committed. From that point, we have 30 minutes to blow the power, or Yen suffocates. We descend into the miniature of the vault. Then, from above, descending still, this is the real deal, the Bellagio vault. A clock reads 8.03. Once electricity goes, all entry points to the vault and its elevator will automatically lock down for two minutes. That's when we make our move. Two guards wheel in a cash cart and leave it in the vault's center and march out again, closing the thick metal door behind them. When the vault locks click, we stop descending just above the cash cart. There is silence for a spell. The lights flicker out. Then, the false top of the cart springs open, revealing Yen within, folded neatly. He inhales deeply, then slowly unspools himself from the cash cart until, at last, he crouches atop it. 
He takes in the room, vacant and silent, except for Rusty, who walks right by him incongruously. Okay, they put you in the middle of the room, far from everything. You've got to get from the door without touching the floor. What do you do? A wider angle reveals we are in the warehouse the, uh, at night. The Bellagio vault has been fully reproduced here, and what we've been watching has been a trial run. 10 of the 11, Turk and Virgil in guard costumes, Basher is still missing, watch from offstage like a film crew watching a dress rehearsal. Finn says he shorts it. Make it a saw back. From a dead squat, Yen leaps hands first from the cash cart to a ledge five yards away and grips it safely with both hands without touching the floor. From this position, he'll inch his way to a counter, then to the door. Frank pays up. Behind him, a door slams, and he turns to see Basher at last. Sniffing the air, he double takes. Basher's covered head to toe in sewage. And he's yeah, we ain't taking shit, man. Exterior warehouse night. Linus hoses Basher off, his accent angry and thick, as he spits out water and the story of his afternoon. And if nobody understands a word he's saying, that's okay. Yeah, all right, well, that damn boxy demo crew didn't use a coaxial to back up the main lot. I just nosed it right up. The fucking starters, they nosed it right up. You understand what I'm saying? They blew up the backup grid one by one like fucking dominoes, all right? It's all just totally up. It's totally poked it up and it's totally and we're sitting in it. Basher, what happened? Flashback, interior Vegas sewers that afternoon. A cabal of city engineers investigates subterranean fuse boxes and Basher tails them, hiding near a waterfall of effluent. All right, they did exactly what I planned to do, except they did it first and they did it by accident. Now we, they know their weaknesses and they're fixing it. So, so, unless we decide to do this job, uh, we could by tomorrow. Hang on, we can use a pinch. What is a pinch? All right, a, a pinch is an equivalent of a cardiac arrest for a broadband electrical circuitry, right? Or better, yeah, a pinch is a bomb, but without the bomb. Like every time a nuclear weapon detonates, it unleashes an electromagnetic pulse, right? All right, it shuts down any main power source being in the vicinity. That tends to not matter because in most cases, the nuclear weapon destroys everything you might, you know, want to use. I think, and it's powerful anyway, right? So now a pinch creates a similar electromagnetic pulse, but without the headache of mass destruction and death. So instead of Hiroshima, you get a 17th century. Okay, um, for how long? About 10 seconds. Could a pinch take out the power of an entire city? Like, I don't know. Las Vegas? Well, you know, there's only one pinch in the world that can do that. Where? Pasadena. Exterior, Caltech campus night. Headlights hit a sign. Caltech, high security area, keep out. A white van shoots past it. Interior white van, night. Turk and Virgil man the front seats as Danny, Basher, Yen, and Linus huddle in the back. Basher and Yen both prepare equipment for their raid. Hooks and a rope for Yen, a small blowtorch, and a drill for Basher. You two ready? They nod, and with Danny, start out the van's rear door. Linus starts to follow, but... What are you doing? I'm here with you. <laughs> but... The van door slams in his face. Exterior lab at perimeter door, night. Danny picks a lock, and then he, Yen, and Basher disappear into the lab's interior. Interior, white van. Linus twiddles his thumbs, tired of being seated at the kids' table. Meanwhile, up front, another Mensa meeting has been called to order. Bro, you gonna ask me a question? Are you a man? Yes, 19 questions. Are you alive? Yes, 18 questions. <sighs> Evil Knievel. Shit! All right, your turn. Same Co theme later. Squared over point zero four five five. No, no, no. Cosine squared over point zero four one five. Point zero four five five. One five. You're so wrong. You don't know your string theory, bitch. Same scene later. Mom told me she loves me more. Yeah, well, she told me she was going to tell you that, and uh, she breastfed me longer than she breastfed you, so. Stop it. You make me stop, make it. Stop no, you make me stop it. You make me stop it. Me. You're oh, I'm going to keep on touching you. I'll keep on touching, touching you. Me. Yeah, well, I'll touch you through, the yeah. 
You look like your beard was drawn on with a marker. They can be heard wrestling. Linus has had enough. He sneaks out the van's back door without the Malloys hearing him. At perimeter door, Linus sulks along the laboratory's perimeter, finds the door Danny picklocked, and disappears inside. Several moments pass, and the next door appears, and Danny, Basher, and Yen appear, pinch in hand. They've succeeded. They weave a path to the van. Meanwhile, in the van, Turk and Virgil are still wrestling as the trio appears. Danny, Basher, and Yen pile in the back. We got it. Let's go. Turk floors it, and they're off. Wait a minute. Turk breaks. They're not. Where's Linus? Everyone realizes he's not here. Just then, sirens and alarms and lights come to life. Uh Uh-oh. Danny spins to look out the back of the van. Basher by his side. His eyes scan the compound. Then... There he is. Danny's POV of the lab and its beveled glass stairwell. Linus scrambles up its steps, a flight ahead of a duo of chasing guards. As he ascends out of the site, Danny shifts his focus to the other side of the building, where two more guards arriving on the roof and moving toward the staircase. Linus will be trapped. Danny, Basher, and Yen squat side by side by side, watching all of this. Yen makes a colorful observation about Linus's predicament. Of course, no one understands him. One of us should help him. There'll be two of us that need saving. Who knows where we are? Uh, both both sets of what? Both sets of guards appear on the rooftop and find no Linus between them. He's disappeared. Where'd he go? Danny and Basher slowly turn. Turk and Virgil crouch inches behind them, wanting to spectate as well. What? Would you? Shouldn't? Shouldn't someone be behind the wheel between us? Crash! Uh... A second story window explodes as a desk chair flies through it, followed shortly by Linus, who leaps onto a steel mesh overhang running alongside the building. All right, back back it up, back it up. Virgil leaps into the driver's seat, shifts into reverse. Linus runs along the overhang, then leaps down onto the reversing van and rolls along its roof and down its windshield. Through the windshield, Virgil jabs his thumb over his shoulder. Get in the back. Come on, come on. Linus scrambles back over the van and Danny and Yen pull him in. Virgil hits the gas for a quick getaway, but he does so before the rear doors are closed, and one of them slams shut right on Yen's hand. Crunch! Ah! Interior van as it hurtles away. Basher tends to Yen, cradling his hand, and Danny stares down at Linus, breathless. I say stay in the van. You stay in the van. Got it? Because you lose focus for one second in this game and someone gets hurt. Got it. They continue staring daggers at one another as the van pulls away into the night. Back in Vegas. It's fight night in Las Vegas. Incoming lanes of the I-15 reflect bumper-to-bumper steel. Planes in the air are stacked for five miles over the desert. Even Gila monsters below seem Vegas-bound. People are flooding in from all over the country to see what has been dubbed the fight to end all fights. Exterior Vegas Day, Jim Lampley broadcast live from a mob strip. And even though it's still five hours away till opening bell, the energy here is fever-pitched. Interior Bellagio, every table is in play, every seat is filled. Interior Bellagio Security Center. The Bellagio's casino manager, the one Linus spied with Benedict earlier, checks in with his watchers. How are we doing? Interior Mirador Suite, day. Livingston has moved AV operations into Lyman Zerga's suite. As he scours the same images the watchers downstairs do, he eavesdrops on their communications through his headset. Can't hear him. Says oh, cotton, cotton couldn't be taller. Got it. In Mirador Suite bathroom, lost in the luxury his role dictates, Saul floats in a full-size jacuzzi and chews on a hundred-dollar cigar. Reuben, meanwhile, paces the floor nervously. Where are they? Well, that's what I want to know. Where are they? They'll be here. They'll be here. Thanks, Fidel. At Livingston's console, Punching up a new set of views from the eye in the sky, Livingston thrusts forward, alarmed by one. Yikes. Interior, Bellagio Casino, lobby. Rusty keeps watch on the hotel's side entrance. He glances at his watch, then outside again, as the white van arrives, dropping off only Linus and Danny. He slaps the van's roof before it pulls away. As Danny and Linus enter the lobby, Rusty falls into step with them, exchanging a smile with Danny, but not Linus. He still looks chastised from the car trailer. Riding up the elevator. You boys have a nice trip? We have a problem. Interior Mirador Suite on Livingston's laptop. A mugshot of Danny complete with vital information, height, weight, criminal history. You've been red flagged. It means the moment Mm -hmm. you step on the casino floor, they'll be watching you. 
like hawks, hawks with video cameras. This is a problem. Saul, mm -hmm. time to get out. It's time when I say it is. Now. I'm out, I'm out. You have any idea how this happened? I do. He's been chasing Benedict's woman. Got into a real snarl with him two nights ago. I was telling you. Who told you to do that? I did. I know you wouldn't leave Tess alone. Who is Tess? My wife. Ex-wife. Tess is here? I'm sorry, but I didn't know if it would sting you, but it did. You're out, Danny. He's out? It's that or we shut down right now. His involvement puts us all at risk. This isn't your call. You made it my call. When you put her ahead of us, you made it mine. This is my job. <clears throat> Not anymore. But everyone in the room is on Rusty's side. Defeated, Danny stalks out of the room onto a balcony, but not without staring down Linus. But he can't just be out. Who's gonna take his place? Kid, you up for it? All right, find everyone else. Let him know the change in plan. Curtain goes up at seven. Livingston exits. Everyone else in the room staggers about like witnesses after an execution. Rusty steps out onto the balcony, perhaps to console Danny, but their words cannot be heard. Tess is with Benedict now? She's too tall for him. Interior Benedict suite dressing room night. Tess, readying herself for the big evening, meets her own glance in a dressing mirror, then spots Benedict in its reflection, pacing the bedroom behind her. Yes. Yes. No. Very much no. Then inform Mr. Levin he'll find a better view of the fight in front of his television. Surely he must have HBO. Hanging up, Benedict approaches her, puts his hands on her shoulders. What are you thinking about? You. Interior, executive elevator. Riding down, Terry Benedict checks his watch. The elevator doors open and he steps onto the casino floor, the king of Las Vegas. The time is seven o'clock. On balcony overlooking the casino floor, he meets his casino manager according to schedule. Any sign of ocean? Not in a couple hours. You want him out? I can bounce him for the state of parole violation if you want. Put a guy on him. He's here for a reason. I'd like to know what it is. But if he comes anywhere near Tess, take it to the next level. Bruiser? Benedict nods, goes on his way. At casino entrance, Saul, as Lyman Zerga, stands ramrod straight, looking through sliding glass doors out at the valet station. From behind, Terry Benedict approaches, two security guards walking half a pace behind him. Saul spots him in the glass's reflection. He does not turn. Mr. Benedict. Mr. Zerga, it's a very busy night for me. Are we on schedule? I have no reason to suspect otherwise. My courier should be here momentarily. It's a nice evening. Shall we wait outside? POV through binoculars on the Bellagio Valet area. Benedict and Saul emerge, emerge guards positioned around them. Turk. 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 <laughs> Please. Please. Oh, it's me. Oh, I'm Turk. I'll throw in position. <laughs> okay, where I go. A white unmarked van pulls in from the street and races up to the curb where Saul and Benedict wait. Turk Malloy gets out the passenger side, a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist, as Virgil comes around from the driver's side, both of them dressed in their bodyguard suits. Mr. Zerga, a gift from Mr. Hesse. Turk extends the briefcase to Saul so that they both clasp the handle as Virgil produces a key, unlocks the cuff on Turk's wrist, transfers it to Saul's, clamps it shut, and hands Saul the key. Thank you, Friedrich. Gunther. He turns, nods to Benedict, and they retreat into the hotel, 
the security guards and Malloy's flanking them. Interior casino, Frank deals blackjack to a full table. His eyes gaze past the players to Saul, the guards and Benedict passing by. That was a bad night for the house. Moving with Benedict as he spies out of the corner of his eye, Danny lurking at a slot machine to one of his guards. Bye, Mr. Walsh. Hello, Mr. Osteen's in the West Slots. The guard goes and Benedict continues with Saul. I'm afraid I can't allow my private security personnel inside the casino cages. I hope you don't mind. Of course not. Saul turns to dismiss Virgil and Turk when, passing by on his way to a sports betting window, an old racetrack denizen happens past the cabal and, worse yet, happens to recognize Saul. Saul? Saul Bloom? Is that you? Saul, it's me! Bucky, Bucky Buchanan, remember? From Saratoga? Friedrich, Gunter. An order, dispose of this man. Virgil and Turk pick up the denizen by his elbows and haul him away. Mr. Benedict, please. I have never enjoyed the touch of steel to my skin. They proceed. At the slots, Danny sits in a row of octogenarians, all vacantly dropping $1 coins and pulling levers. As he watches Saul and Benedict disappear into the cage, Ding, 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 four cherries. Danny smiles, a big winner, but he's got bigger pots to win tonight. He steers a neighboring senior citizen to his slot machine. Hey there, Pops, you won. And then he slips away. Interior Mirador suite, Linus stands dressed in a sharp conservative suit, a far cry from the threadbare thief in Chicago. Rusty circles him inspecting. All right, where are you gonna put your hands? No, 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 not the pockets either. And don't touch your tie. Look at me. That's how you're gonna stand? No, wrong again. Listen, I ask you a question. You have to think of the answer. Where are you gonna look? Death. You look down, they know you're lying. And up, they know you don't know the truth. Listen, don't use three words when one will do. Don't shift your eyes, look always at your mark, but don't stare. Be um, specific, but not memorable. Funny, but don't make him laugh. He's got to like you, then forget you the moment left to sight. And for God's sake, whatever you do, don't under any circumstances. Hey, Russ, Russ, can you come here a sec? Sure thing. Linus is left utterly bewildered. A thousand commandments to remember and 15 minutes to remember them in. Exterior alley. Turk and Virgil's white van whips around a corner and shoots inside the warehouse. Uh, we never see the exterior, just an air freshener hanging from the rear view mirror. The white van screeches to a halt inches from Basher, who stands ready beside the pinch and the now gutted and dismantled mock-up of the Bellagio vault. And faster than a NASCAR pit crew, Basher, Turk, and Virgil load the pinch into the white van's rear. And before you can say electromagnetic pulse, the van screeches back out of the warehouse fully loaded. The time is 7.16. In the Bellagio cages, the room is empty, save for a large table. Saul places his briefcase on it, adjusts its numbered combination lock, and opens it. Inside the case are five rows of glittering emeralds. They're very beautiful. A gift? Can you lift them out, please? All right, Mr. Zerga, I acknowledge that the case does not contain any dangerous or illicit material. I further agree to take custody of your case for a 24 hour period to store in our secure vault. While I cannot permit you to accompany the case to the vault, Why I- Why not? Insurance for one, security another, and I don't trust you. There is a knock at the door and Walsh, the casino manager, enters. He speaks low in Benedict's ear. I put, oh, oh sorry, Walsh. Who's Walsh? I put two plain cloths on Ocean. He's at the Kino bar now. Mr. Zerga, this is Mr. Walsh, my casino manager. If he will allow, he will arrange for your briefcase to be stored inside our vault while you watch on a security monitor. Those are my terms, yes or no. You leave me no choice. Saul unlocks the cuff from his wrist. Exterior Bellagio Casino kitchen entrance. The white van slows enough to unload Virgil and Turk, changed into waiter uniforms, and they hurry a table clothed room tablecloth room service cart inside as Basher pulls away. Interior Bellagio by the cage door. Rising from a spotless pair of wingtips, shifting side to side, over hands flexing and stretching up to Linus Caldwell. He keeps an eye on the cage door, waiting for Benedict to appear as he tries anything to shake out his nerves. 
Then from a discreet earpiece he wears comes. Deep breaths, you'll do fine. Thanks. No sweat, kid, you're a rock. Now please don't fuck up. Interior Mirador suite on Livingston's monitor. Linus's smile disappears as he continues to bounce. There's a knock at the door. Room service. Who, uh, who are the penny? Rusty checks through the peephole, then ushers in Turk and Virgil in costume with their room service cart. You ready? Oh, sorry. Uh, Livingston raises a hand and as Turk serves him his plate, Virgil whips off the cart's tablecloth. Underneath is a false lids cash cart. Rusty turns to a corner. You ready? In it, Yen finishes bandaging his busted hand and nods. Interior Bellagio Security Center. The guards sit before their monitors, feet kicked up, as behind them, Walsh, Benedict, and Saul enter. Kirsten, I think you're Walsh, right? Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. This is our security center where we oversee all gaming in the casino, as well as our vault. You'll be able to monitor your briefcase from here. Walsh coughs. The two watchers leap immediately to their feet. Benedict's, Benedict checks his watch. Don't let me keep you. Mr. Sergo. And Benedict takes his leave. Interior Mirador suite. Linus, you're up. Interior Bellagio Casino by the cage door. Linus nods, shakes out his hands some more. Deep breaths, deep breaths. And here comes Benedict exiting the cage just as his assistant arrives with his portfolio. As he turns toward the restaurant. Mr. Benedict. Yeah. Sheldon Willis, Nevada Gaming Commission. Could I have two minutes of your time? Of course, anything for the NGC. At the Kino Bar, Danny watches Benedict escort Linus toward the blackjack tables, unaware that two plainclothes security goons watch him from across the bar. And when he turns in their direction, they look away, acting incognito. But it's not them he's turning toward. It's Tess, rounding a corner toward the restaurant. Danny jumps to his feet, throws a tip on the bar, and goes. Interior Mirador Suite. The time is 7.27. Yen tucks himself into the cash cart's hidden compartment with a slim oxygen tank for company. Meanwhile, Rusty drills Virgil and Turk. Okay, when do you make the deposit? Not until we get your signal. Yeah, what do we look like, a couple of jackasses or something? Yeah. Um, amazing, how's it feel? You all right? Yen yeah, nods. You want something to read? Magazine? From the table of limbs, a middle finger protrudes to show Rusty what he can do with that magazine. Okay, I'm counting down. 30 minutes of breathing time starts now. A running clock appears on screen, descending from 29.59. It will remain there for the duration of the pre-pinch heist, jumping at times between scenes. Rusty seals Yen inside the cash cart, then gives the top a tug. It's shut tight. As Virgil redresses it with the tablecloth, Turk snatches back Livingston's penne on the way to the door. Ugh, you get no tip. Interior, casino floor. Time remaining 28 minutes, 37 seconds, and counting. Moving with Benedict and Linus into the pit boss's station. It only came to our attention this morning, Mr. Benedict. A apparently he has a record longer than my arm. If he is who you say he is. Charlie, call over Ramon Escalante. Certainly, Mr. Benedict. Benedict and Linus wait side by side. While Linus does his best to play it cool, Benedict dips into his portfolio. Interior, Mirador Suite, on Livingston Mont Livingston's monitor, we see an overhead view of Benedict as he pulls out the combination to the vault, reads it, then buries it in his jacket pocket. Did you make it out? His head blocked the last two numbers. We missed it, Linus. You gotta grab the combination yourself. Interior, Bellagio Casino. Linus half nods in response and Benedict notices. Suspicious of the young man, he decides to test him. You knew it's the commission? In there about two years. Oh, I know how Lindley over there. You work with him at all? Not since he died last year. He passed. 
The pit boss returns with Frank in tow. Mr. Mr. Escalante, would you come with us, please? Uh, what, what is this about? I think it's better if we talk off the floor. Linus and Benedict lead Frank away. As they pass an elevator, its doors open, revealing Turk and Virgil dressed now as security guards, pushing out the false lid cash cart. They leave behind a pile of dishes, waiter uniforms, and a tablecloth. Interior restaurant. 24 minutes, 20 second, uh, 24 minutes, 26 seconds remaining and counting. A maitre d' scours his reservations list, then peers up to find Ruben Tishkoff approaching. On either side of him, two gorgeous young women. Good evening, Mr. Tishkoff. Good evening, Marcel. My nieces and I would like a table, something quiet before the fight. I can put you at uh, 19 in just a couple of minutes. Uh, quick as you can. The meter's running here. Commander D turns to his next customer, Tess. She, of course, merits a table instantly. Good evening, Miss Ocean. Right this way. Ruben can't help but stare as Tess passes by. His eyes linger a little too long and a little too low. Hey. Try to keep your tongue in your mouth. Mm. Yeah, pal, well, only if you take your thumb out of your... <clears throat> Ruben gets brushed from behind by the two plainclothes goons following Danny. Hey, you have any idea who I think I am? <laughs> at Tessa's usual table, just as she's sitting, Danny approaches. She goes straight at him, ap apoplectic. It... No. I'll just be a moment. I'm having you thrown out of here. She starts past him. He grabs her arm to keep her, and she wheels on him. You're up to something, Danny. What? And you, don't say you came here for me. You're pulling a job, aren't you? Well, know this. No matter what it is, you won't win me back. I can't afford it. Just came to say goodbye. Oh, then um, goodbye. Bye. Danny starts for her cheek, stops to see if it's all right with her. She, sad-eyed, does not recoil, and then gently kisses. Good. Danny leaves, Tess watches him go. Goodbye, Danny. At the restaurant's entrance, Danny runs smack into the plainclothes goons. Mr. Ocean, Mr. Benedict would like to see you. I thought he might. They escort Danny away, right past Ruben, who frowns, concerned. Interior Bellagio Casino Manager's Office, 1825 left on the clock. Frank stands at attention before Linus and Benedict. Linus, straddling a desk, takes a beeper off his belt when it pinches him. Benedict checks his watch. The, fight open the fight's opening bell is growing closer and closer. Thank you for your cooperation, Mr. Escalante. Or should I call you Mr. Catton? You are Frank Catton, formerly of the Tropicana, the Desert Inn, and the New York State Penitentiary System. Your silence suggests you don't refute that. Mr. Benedict, I'm afraid you've been employing an ex-convict. As you know, the NGC strictly forbids. Ah, uh, damn cracker. Pardon me? You heard me. Just because a black man tries to earn a decent wage in this state. This has nothing to do with. Some cracker cowboy like you's got to kick him out on the street, want me to jump down, turn around, pick up, won't let me deal cards, might as well call it white jack. I resent your implication that race has anything to do with this. Now, as I was saying, the Nevada Gaming Commission strictly forbids the employment of the, the, uh, I mean. That does it. Frank attacks Linus, lunging at the man. And as Benedict steps in to separate the two, Linus's hand dips into his tuxedo jacket and withdraws the vault combination. Okay. Okay. I'm cool. You all right? Yeah. Interior Mirador Suite. He's got it. Virgil, Turk, deliver your package. Interior Bellagio Casino by the cage door. 1405 left on the clock. Two guards stand sentry outside the cage door. Virgil and Turk move up with their cash cart, and when Virgil reaches for his key card, 
it's gone. Ah, Jesus. I, th- I, I lost my card. What's going on here? I think, Jesus, I lost my card. Okay, leave the cart. Go find it. Take this cart instead. The sentry nods, swipes his key card, and enters with the cash cart. Turk and Virgil hesitate a moment to watch it enter, then hurry off. Interior Bellagio Security Center. On a monitor, the sentry pushes the cart down a cage corridor. On another, Saul's briefcase is escorted by another guard to the vault elevator. On another, Danny is escorted inside the cage by the plainclothes goons. There it is now. Wonderful. On the monitors, the cash cart with Yen inside joins Saul's briefcase on the elevator. Pull out to interior Mirador suite, 1119 left on the clock. That's my cue. Give Bash for the go. Bash, what's your status? Exterior Bellagio parking lot moving with Basher. Driving the white van, listening to a books on tape of Jane Eyre. Bash! Hey, no need to yell. What's your status? Meh. And he screeches to a halt in the parking structure's top level. Vegas can be seen in every direction. Interior, cage hallway, 836, left on the clock. Benedict exits the casino manager's office with Linus and Frank. Benedict hails two guards. Please show this man off the premises. Don't step foot in my casino again. Hacker. Benedict checks his watch again. He's really running late. Mr. Wills, if you don't mind. Mr. Wills? Mr. Wills? Yes. Of course. Uh, yes. My beeper. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot it. Benedict hesitates. He's in an enormous hurry now. He's behind schedule. He hates being behind schedule, but leaving even a member of the gaming commission alone in his cage is a security risk. One glance at the camera's all about, and he decides to skip. You know how to get back out? Of course. Enjoy the fight. Thank you. Linus smiles after him, withdrawing the page of combinations he lifted off the man. Exterior, Bellagio Casino, 647 and counting. The guards show Frank out. Frank tries to tip them. Thanks, fellas. <laughs> but they snarl at him before returning inside. Frank smiles and goes on his way, his job complete. Interior, interrogation room, 636 left on the clock. Danny sits opposite two plainclothes goons in absolute silence, waiting. How much longer do you think Mr. Benedict will be? Just a few minutes more. No cameras in this room, huh? Doesn't want anyone seeing what happens in here. He's not coming, is he? Who is? There's a knock at the door and the goons smile. Danny's about to find out who's coming. One goon rises to usher in the bruiser. Come to beat the shit out of Danny Ocean. The guy's at least 6'6", 300 pounds, but it's not his size that draws attention. It's his teeth or the lack thereof. The bruiser doesn't hold a single incisor, molar, or bicuspid in his mouth. Gum city. And there's something really terrifying about the sight. I guess Mr. Benedict didn't like me talking to his girl. The goons shake their heads. Danny smiles at the bruiser and the bruiser snarls back, showing off those gums. He rolls up his shirt sleeves, itching to tear a hole in this man. The goons head for the door. We're gonna step outside. Leave you two to talk things over. They exit. As Danny opens his mouth to speak, Bruiser's fist flashes out and knocks him down. Danny rises, wiping a little blood from his lip. Jesus, Bruiser, not until later. Sorry, Danny. I, uh, I forgot. It's okay. How's the wife? Pregnant again. Oh, well, then we better get to work. Outside the interrogation room, standing guard outside, the goons hear punches and groans from inside as Danny climbs onto Bruiser's shoulders and pushes through the ceiling rafters, groaning every time Bruiser slaps his fist into his hand. Inside the vault, the guard wheels in the yen-filled cash cart, parks it in a station next to its twin, then, as an afterthought, places Saul's briefcase right on top of it, an unforeseen obstacle to Yen's escape. Oh, shit. In the Mirador suite, Nope, just kidding. In the Bellagio Security Center, four minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock, Saul witness this, witnesses this too and stifles a reaction. Uh, does that satisfy you, Mr. Zerga? 
Yes, I'm very satisfied. Close it up. On the monitor, the vault door closes, but Saul looks anything but satisfied. He's sweaty, his mouth so dry he can't swallow, and he keeps patting down his pockets for his roll aids without finding them. You all right, sir? Interior cage hallway, moving with Linus four minutes, two seconds left on the clock. Linus circumspectly approaches the vault elevator door, checking up and down hallways for guards. Interior mirror door suite. On a monitor, Linus comes into view. Almost there, kid. Interior Bellagio Security Center. And Saul spots him, but so does the guard. Who's that? And Saul can't handle the suspense. He grips his arm and groans, and this is no <laughs> ulcer problem. This is a full-fledged cardiac. And Walsh and the guards all attend to him, their backs turned, as in the cage in the hallway, 342 left on the clock, Linus hurries to the elevator, punching Benedict's combination into a keypad. The elevator doors open for him. Interior mirror door suite. Livingston punches a few keys. Going to video now. Interior Bellagio Security Center. As Saul and his heart attack hold the spotlight, a security monitor flips from a shot of Linus entering the elevator to a Livingston-fed videotape of an empty lift. Call for a doctor. Interior elevator, 315 left on the clock. Linus immediately reaches up to the elevator's ceiling, rips down its panel to reveal a trap door. As he starts to push it open, a hand yanks it free from above. It's Danny. You didn't really think I was going to set this one out, did you? You didn't trust me? I do now. He reaches down and pulls Linus wide-eyed up to the roof of the elevator. Interior, MGM Grand Garden Arena, three minutes left on the clock. The boxers enter the ring before a full cheering house. Benedict and Tess find their ringside seats, a row in front of Reuben and his nieces. Ladies and gentlemen. Interior Bellagio Casino by the cage door, 256 and counting. Rusty approaches the sentry on duty at the cage door. Yes, someone called for a doctor. Interior elevator shaft above the elevator, 221 and counting. Danny rips off his jacket and shirt to expose a repelling line wrapped around his torso. Linus does the same. How'd you get here? Crawl space. Then I had to give away a couple mil. But what about, I mean, that whole thing with Rusty. Flashback. Exterior Mirador Suite. Balcony. Earlier that night, just after Rusty kicked Danny off the job, as Linus watches from inside, Danny and Rusty confer. You think the kid bought it? Oh, I think Reuben bought it, and he knew we were screwing around. You sure about this? Bobby Caldwell threw me into the pool first time. The least I could do is give his kid a push. Interior elevator shaft above the elevator. Why do you make me go through all this? Why not just tell me? Well, where's the fun in that? Come on, Ian's got about three minutes of air left. Danny leads Linus down and around the elevator and side by side, they crawl onto the bottom of the elevator, gripping the undercarriage of the lift to keep from falling. Meanwhile, we descend quickly down the shaft just to illustrate how very high up they are. Interior Bellagio Security Center, 53 seconds and counting. Rusty, playing doctor, inspects Saul. At the same time, he inspects a monitor, the vault door closing with the yen-filled cash cart and Saul's briefcase inside. Rusty stops, listens to Saul's chest, and then drops his head. I'm very sorry. He is gone. Walsh and the guards all bow their heads. At the door, two paramedics arrive with a stretcher. You're too late, guys. He's dead. The first paramedic turns to his partner and admonishes him. I told you to hurry. Interior elevator shaft. Below the elevator, 42 seconds and counting. As Danny and Linus work of fixing suction cupped anchors to their repelling lines. Who do you like tonight? Huh? Tyson or Lewis? The fight? Lewis. You like Tyson? Mm. How strongly do you feel about it? Are you looking for action? I go in for a buck. Buck it is. And they're ready, poised at the top, looking into the abyss of an elevator shaft scattered with infrared sensors. Livingston, we're set. Interior casino floor outside the cages. Rusty leads the paramedics out with the dead Saul on their gurney. Livingston, we're set. Interior mirador suite, 21 seconds remaining. Basher, we're set. Exterior, Bellagio parking lot, top level, 17 seconds remaining. I ain't going a minute. We don't have a minute. Yen's going to pass out in 13 seconds. Give me 13 seconds. Basher leaps down to hook up the pinch's wires to his van's engine. Interior, MGM Grand Garden Arena, 10 seconds left. 
The opening bell rings, round one. The fighters break from their corners, fainting, jabbing. Sitting ringside, Benedict looks at Tess and smiles as she winces at the first sharp blow. Interior elevator shaft, five seconds remain. Peering down into blackness, Danny and Linus prepare to let go any moment. You ever repelled before? Mm. Nope. You ever repelled before? No. Nope. You? Nope. Exterior, Bellagio parking lot, top level. One second remains. Basher finishes preparations. Ready. Then hit it. Basher flips the switch. Boom! A quick tremor, then stillness. He picks a point on the horizon like Babe Ruth, and suddenly... One. High above Las Vegas, whole blocks of lights disappear, casinos vanishing one by one. Flamingo, every pink light vanishes. Bellagio, the fountain goes flaccid. Two. Three. New York, New York, the roller coaster stops dead. Its passengers keep their arms raised, not sure what to do. MGM Grand Garden Arena. Both fighters move in simultaneously, sweat flying. Both reach back, both going for the lights out. Power cut to the jaw when lights out. Four, five. Interior elevator shaft. Blip, out go the infrared sensors. Now. He and Linus fall, lean forward and fall. Hurtling with Danny and Linus down the elevator shaft. Upside down, heads curled, and all we hear is the whoosh of their bodies in motion and the whirl of their cords uncoiling. Six, seven. And now, looking straight down, the ground is rising up fast to meet them, a flat slab of gray concrete, 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, 20. Eight, nine. And snap, the cords reach their full extension, and Danny and Linus bounce up, watching the floor recede. Ah! Exterior Bellagio parking lot, top level. 10. In the distance, lights come up again, first at the Mirage, then the MGM, gradually approaching. Interior elevator shaft at the bottom, coming to a rest about 10 feet from the floor, Danny quickly pulls a slim blade and slashes the two coils straight across. He and Linus go tumble, drop lines for coil, lightning fast to their elevator anchors, just before the infrared lights go back online. Interior, MGM Grand Garden Arena. The lights suddenly flash back on, revealing both fighters standing and Tyson takes advantage of Lewis's disorientation and throws a sucker punch to his jaw. Down goes Lewis and up goes the crowd, roaring. One, two, three. What the hell was that? He cranes his neck, looking around the room, surveying his empire. He smells a rat. His eyes fall on Reuben behind him, but Reuben just shrugs. The first goddamn round. Exterior Bellagio parking lot, top level. All the lights are back on and Basher observes his achievement with great pride, his job complete. For Las Vegas. Interior elevator shaft at the bottom. Linus and Danny arise from where they've fallen, clutching their heads and rubbing bruises. Danny doesn't recover as quickly. You all right? Uh, no, but you're sweet to ask. Interior Bellagio vault. Lights are just flickering on when the false lid of the cash cart thrusts upward slightly. It's Yen trying to get out, out of air, and only now alert to Saul's heavy case resting atop him. Interior, Mirador Suite, night. Livingston watches this on his monitors, just coming back on, his finger poised on the play button as Frank comes in the door. Are they in? One second. I got kicked out. Frank shrugs. Oh, Suddenly one of the monitors aligns itself and Livingston presses play. On monitor A, overhead security cam view of the vault corridor. The three Uzi guards stand idly on duty. And of the vault itself, Yen trying to get out of the cash cart. On monitor B, overhead security cam view of the vault corridor. The three Uzi guards stand idly on duty and in totally different positions. Of the vault, no cash cart, but no Zerga briefcase, no Yen. This tape's from last night. Same guards, same. His eyes fixing on Saul's briefcase, pushing closer to the edge of the cart of the cash cart as Yen tries to free himself. Shift. Interior Bellagio Security Center, eye in the sky. The room is abuzz with activity. The monitors here flicker back on, too, displaying the images from monitor B, but every watcher in the place is watching a table because the floor is going nuts. After the 10 seconds of darkness, all bets are off. Some players double down during the blackout. Others miraculously have their bets. Consequently, Livingston's video feed switch goes unnoticed. Interior, corridor, outside vault. Danny and Linus pry open the elevator doors and squeeze out just beyond the next doorway stand. Uh, just beyond the next doorway stand three Uzi carrying guards hovering outside the vault door and wondering what the hell just happened to the lights. Inside the vault, Yen continues to push up on the cash cart lid, and the more he pushes, the more Saul's briefcase slides off. 
stretches his hand out to grab it, but it slid beyond his reach to the edge of the falling, to the edge of falling. Interior, corridor, outside the vault. The Uzi carrying guards turn their backs to the elevator shaft and Linus and Danny appear in the doorway. They both snap gas pellets and slide them into the corridor. Jesus, Ron, was that you? Outside the vault corridor, Linus and Danny wait. Danny silently mouthing a three count before thud, thud, thud. They peer around the corner to find all three Uzi carrying guards lie unconscious on the ground. Linus starts in, Danny holds him back. Okay, not yet. Okay. Interior vault corridor. Danny and Linus enter, waving the faint rem- remnants of the gas from their noses, tiptoeing past the guards' bodies. I think Yen made it out okay? I'm sure he's fine. Inside the vault, Saul's briefcase inches closer to falling off the cash cart, which of course would trigger the floor sensor and terminate the heist there and now. Yen's hand stretches farther out to grab it, pushing up just a little more on the false slid until the briefcase tumbles toward the floor, but not before Yen snags the handcuff chain attached to it and swings it around. He's got it. That threat over, he throws open the cash cart lid and takes the biggest breath of his life. Interior, vault corridor. Linus punches in the code for the door to the vault anteroom, the one he stole from Benedict. He steps back as it slides open, revealing the vault door. It is sleek and immense and impregnable. Jesus. There's a Chinese man with $160 million behind that door. Let's get him out. Danny takes a flat hand and slaps the door hard. Interior vault. Yen now sits perched atop the cash cart, Saul's briefcase open beside him. He has removed half of Lyman's emeralds. He hears the muffled Danny slaps and he knows it's time for his leap. It's the same distance as the leap he made in the practice session, but this time he's only got one good hand. Interior Mirador suite. Frank and Livingston watch nervously. Ken says he shorts it. No bet. <laughs> Inside the vault, Yen prepares for his leap, then springs. He springs across the room to the ledge he must grab, and he grabs it, but with only one hand, he's slipping right away, and in a second, he'll hit the censored floor. But in a flash, he spins and splits his legs, propping himself up between two walls, inches above the floor, an acrobatic wonder. Interior Mirador suite. Frank and Livingston exhale. <laughs> Dead. Outside the vault, Danny, oblivious to this close call, slaps the door again. A moment passes, and then Yen responds with a slap, too. Okay. Interior Mirador suite night. As Basher enters, Livingston and Frank watch on a monitor, Linus punching in the combination he stole from Benedict, as Danny unravels a thin electrical wire connected to a detonator. That's it? There's still the five pins in the floor sensor. Not much we can do about that from this side of the door. But from this side... He punches up the image of Yen in the vault. You know, a little bit of syntax to do the trick. Inside the vault, Yen sets the last of Lyman's emeralds against the vault door like a plastic explosive, which of course it is. He affixes a detonator receiver the size of a golf ball pencil to it, then slaps the door twice, all set. Outside the vault, Danny responds with two slaps of his own. He steps back, detonator in hand, its wires attached to the vault door. Counting down from 20 now. Inside the vault, Yen starts his retreat from the door, but gets yanked back. His hand's bandage is caught on the door. 17, 16, 15. Yen tries to free himself, but he can't use his other hand lest he drop to the floor. He tries gnawing at his bandage, which brings his face within inches of a plastic explosive. 11, 10, 9. Livingston et al. are alert to the danger. Linus, can you read me? Linus, do not blow the door. You're about to kill Yen. Outside the vault, Linus hears nothing through his earpiece. Five, four. Three. Yen finally frees himself just as one. He presses his detonator. Nothing. Inside the vault, Yen, still on the door, remains frozen, trembling, a beat. Then he starts to creep back, leaping onto a money shelf, then another, as far from the explosive as he can get. Danny presses it again, still nothing. Wrong. I don't know. Can I get some batteries? Uh. Interior mirror door suite. Livingston, Frank, and Basher watch the monitors in disbelief. Saul enters, alive and dresses himself again. His job is complete. Everything going okay? In the vault corridor, Danny checks his batteries. Linus ransacks the Uzi carrying guards gear for replacements, and he finds double A's in their flashlights. No, you lose focus for one second in this game. Someone gets hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't hear Yen complaining. He takes the batteries, inserts them in his detonator, then slaps the door twice more. Yen catches his breath on the far end of the room. He hears the slap, rolls his eyes, and ducks out of the line of fire. fire. Outside the vault, Danny presses the detonator. The emeralds explode. Several muted but powerful blasts. Linus inches forward, almost dreading this moment. Pauses. Do it. 
He pulls and the door opens. Inside the vault, Danny and Linus enter. Silence. The cash carts have crumpled and the vault gratings blackened have held. Amazing. Linus goes to one of the racks and tentatively opens it. Yen pops up from within, his hair on end, looking like he just dropped out of a cyclone. Where the fuck you been? Interior Mirador Suite Night. Livingston, Frank, Saul, and Basher watch as the first wave of bills gets tossed into the vault floor. Smiles all around. You ever been in love? No, I guess not. Not really. This is better. <clears throat> Inside the casino, outside the fight arena, Rusty steps forward as people stream past him out of the fight arena. He dials his cell phone and listens. Interior MGM Grand Garden Arena. Moving with Benedict and Tess, pushing their way out through the crowd. A phone is ringing nearby again and again. You gonna answer it? I don't have a cell phone. They keep moving, but the ring pursues them. Finally, Benedict stops, pulls Tess's purse from her shoulder, and opens it. Inside, he finds a cell phone ringing. It isn't mine. See who's on the other end. Hello? May I have a word with Mr. Benedict, please? It's for you. Who the hell is this? It's the woman who's robbing you. Interior, Bellagio Security Center. Benedict enters and fear enters with him. And of course, Tess. As the room buzzes with activity, he keeps the cell phone pressed to his ear. What the hell is going on down there in the vault? Nothing, sir. All normal. Show me. All quiet. I'm afraid you're mistaken. Interior, Mirador Suite. Frank, Basher, and Saul watch over Livingston's shoulder as this phone conversation is broadcast over a small speaker. You watching your monitor? Okay, keep watching. Livingston punches in numbers. Interior, Bellagio Security Center. On the monitor, new images suddenly appear. Three masked men in the vault throw stacks of money onto the floor. The three Uzi guard lie bound and unconscious. The security center, understandably, erupts in activity. Jesus Christ. Inside the Bellagio, Rusty strolls so casually there's no reason anyone passing would suspect he was doing more than ordering a pizza. You know, in this town, your luck can change just that quickly. In the security center. Find out how much money we have it down there. Tess, amid all this chaos, is still curious. How did that cell phone get into her handbag? And suddenly it hits her. Flashback, restaurant earlier that evening. Goodbye. Danny starts with her cheek, stops to see if it's all right with her. She sad-eyed, does not recoil, and then gently kisses it as he slips the cell phone into her handbag unnoticed. All right, you've proven your point. You've broken into my vault. Congratulations, you're a dead man. Mm, maybe. May I ask, how do you expect to leave here, hmm? Do you believe I'll simply allow you to parade bags full of my money out of my casino doors? <laughs> no, no, of course not. You're going to carry it out for us. <laughs> and why would I do that? Take a closer look at your monitors. He does. As, unit... Go Sorry. As the three masked men stuff money into large canvas bags and mark the bags with X's, another portion of cash remains untouched, booby-trapped. As your floor manager is probably reporting to you by now, you have a little over 160 million in your vault tonight. You may notice we're only packing up about half that. The other half are leaving in your vault, booby trapped as a hostage. You let our 80 million go and you get to keep your 80 million. That's the deal. Try and stop us, we're gonna blow both cash loads. Rusty spins and gasp, comes face to face with Tess. She stares at him directly, she knows. Mr. Benedict, you can lose 80 million secretly tonight or you can lose $160 million publicly. It's your decision. Hi, Tess. Inside the security center, Benedict cups his phone too and vents his rage. He knows what he should do, let the money go. And he knows what he wants to do, stop these sons of bitches. He makes his choice. Make the call. Walsh grabs a phone, punches some numbers. 911, emergency response. Interior, Mirador Suite. Livingston listens in on the call. Hello, this is Mr. Walsh. Uh, we have an incident here. Okay, you have a deal. 
Back on the casino floor, Tess and Rusty hold a stare as Rusty holds, holds the phone. Where's Danny? Uh, he's fine. He wants you to go upstairs and watch some TV. He does. You have a deal. It's all right, Tess. I promise. Okay, good. Now here's what you're going to do. Five minutes from now, the men in the vault are going to deposit six bags in the vault elevator. Tess isn't sure what to do. As Rusty continues on the phone, she backs off, debating. Can she blow the whistle on her ex? Inside the vault elevator, we see six canvas bags, each sealed tight, each marked with an X, loaded onto the vault elevator. Now, if they meet anyone, we'll blow the money in the bags and in the vault. Inside the cage, outside the elevator, a small cadre of guards await the arrival of the vault elevator. Its doors open to reveal the six large canvas bags, each sealed tight, marked with an X. Now, one minute after that, the elevator will rise to your cages. Six of your guards will pick up the bags and carry them out into the casino. And they do exactly that. Back in the casino, moving with Rusty past the slot machines. Now, if they take more than 20 minutes, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. If they take more than 20 seconds to reach the casino floor, or if there's any indication a switch has been made, we'll blow the money in the vault and the money in the bags. A slot machine rings behind him and Benedict inside the security center hears it. He's in the casino right now. Of course I'm in the casino. In fact, I'm staying in your hotel and I have two words for you, mini bar. Now, as soon as your guards hit the casino floor. Interior casino night, the six guards appear from the cage door carrying six canvas bags marked with X's. Bellagio security escorts them from the building. A white unmarked van is gonna pull up to the valet station. Outside the casino, a white van, now clean of the Nevada telecom sign, idles before the Bellagio, its windows tinted, the driver's identity inscrutable. It is swarmed by security, but they maintain a wide perimeter. Your guards will load the bags into the van's rear. If anyone so much as approaches the driver's door, we blow everything. The guards carry out the money and load it into the van's rear. There they find a video camera mounted within the back seat of the van monitoring them. Still, they cannot catch a glimpse of the driver. They close the van doors. Bellagio, we see the white van depart the valet station in front, clandestinely shadowed by five sedans. Meanwhile, behind the casino, a SWAT van arrives and unloads its squad. Now what? When I get word that the van hasn't been followed, that the money is secure, my men will exit the building, and once their safety is confirmed, you'll get your vault back. Interior, Bellagio Security Center. Walsh mouths to Benedict, SWAT team is here. Benedict nods and throws him a thumbs up. Sir, I have complied with your every request. Would you agree? Yes, I would. Good. Now, I have one of my own. Oh, do tell. Run and hide, asshole. Run and hide. If you get picked up next week buying a $100,000 sports car in Newport Beach, I'll... Be supremely disappointed because I want my people to find you and rest assured when they do, they won't hand you over to the police. So my advice for you again is this, run and hide. That is all I ask. During the above rant by Benedict, we view the Mirador suite now empty, Livingston's monitors still displaying the masked men in the vault. In the white van, it's navigating the streets of Las, An of Las Vegas. The five sedans tailing the van, security goons piled into each, and maybe we noticed, or maybe not, the Rolls Royce tailing them. Tess, pacing in Benedict's suite, biting her nails, debating whether to blow the whistle on Danny. On TV, a newscast of the contentious aftermath of the prize fight. Uzi guards, bound and unarmed, unconscious to the activity within the vault. Rusty's cell phone, opened and unmanned. Benedict listens. The line has gone dead. He hangs up. Our guys say the van is headed towards McCarran Airport. Get everyone in position. I want my vault back before that van hits the tarmac. Longer montage now, cutting between the SWAT team, six and all, hustling through the cage corridors, armed to the teeth with body armor and helmets and vision guards. They're as faceless as stormtroopers. The white van convoy as it approaches McCarran Airport. Monitors of the vault, the three masked men pace beside the booby-trapped money. Interior, security center. Where's Zerga? Mr. Zerga with the briefcase. 
uh, he's, he died. The SWAT team rappelling down the elevator shaft, its ultraviolet sensors turned off by Walsh, then moving into position. Interior, Bellagio Security Center. Night goggles on, prepare to cut power. Ready when you are. Do it. Cut it. Cut it. Flips the power switch. Interior, mirror door suite. Livingston's monitors all go black. Interior, Bellagio Security Center. The monitors here go black as well. Benedict listens closely to the SWAT frequency. First wave in, second wave now. Guys, someone's in here. Take him down, take him down now. A brief spurt of gunfire, then <laughs> dead silence in the eye of the sky. Slim stares deep into a monitor's dark pitch, and then? Lights, lights, we need power now. Flips the switch back on and on the monitors, visions of destruction down below. Smoke fills the vault as two SWAT members push through it. Other SWAT members help evacuate the unconscious guards. What's the situation down there? They blew it. They blew the, oh Jesus. If there was anyone in there, they're, they're not in one piece anymore. Tell them to take the van. I'm going down there. Find out how they fiddle with our cameras. Exterior, McCarran Airport. As the white van arrives at a, a charter airline's entrance, the five sedans converge upon it, tires screeching, goons emerging, weapons drawn. Get out of the van, now, now. No response within the van. The head goon signals and the others shoot the van's tires. Interior, circuitry room. A guard investigates the eye in the sky's wiring. Reaching deep into the mesh, he finds a foreign object, Livingston's spider. Interior, vault corridor. The vault, elevators, uh, the vault elevator doors open and Terry Benedict makes his way into his smoke-filled vault corridor. He passes the Uzi guards awake now and stumbling to the elevator with SWAT members' assistance, then arrives before his decimated vault. Anything within, people, money, lime manzergas to emeralds, could only have been destroyed. Over SWAT leader's shoulder as he approaches Benedict. Uh, Mr. Benedict. Yes. Um, we couldn't find any survivors. Um or I'm afraid any of your money. I'm sorry, sir. Take your men out now. Hold on Benedict seething as the SWAT leader steps away. Okay, guys, grab your beer and your gear and clear out. How are we with the van? Exterior, McCarran Airport. The stalemate with the van continues, still no movement from inside. Out of the van now, hands up. An employee from the charter airline sticks his head out of his office door. Hey, what's going on here? Half a dozen firearms turn and point in his direction. The employee disappears back inside his office. The head goon cautiously approaches the van, reaches for the driver's door, and yanks it open. Inside, there is no driver, just a video camera mounted at eye level. The head goon cranes back his head, befuddled, when he notices for the first time, and maybe we do too, an enormous antenna sprouting up from the van's rear bumper. The van suddenly lurches. A short distance away, close on a remote control, complete with a tiny video monitor displaying the van driver's POV and a steering mechanism. It's a near replica of the one Virgil Malloy used in the monster truck drag race against his brother. The, and Virgil's using it now too. And he sits next to Ruben Tishkoff in one of Ruben's rolls and watches the goons scramble back from the flat tired van. Hey, enough monkey business. Virgil brings the van to a stop then readies a distinctive red button on his remote back with the van as the head goon reaches for the rear door, his hand inches away when <gasps> the door explodes, explodes open. Knocked on his ass, the head goon watches as the canvas X bags burn within, burn to cinders. He does, however, happen to notice one burning shred of paper dislodged from a bag. It's a promotional flyer for a call girl service. Interior Bellagio vault. Benedict steps over the scattered remains of his vault. He picks up a fragment of a cash cart, burnt to a crisp, then lets it drop. Mr. Benedict. Yes. Um, they took the van. And? Uh, they blew up the bag, sir. <sighs> Shit. Sir, uh, sir. What, Walsh? They say it doesn't look like there was any money in the bag, sir. What? They say the bags were filled with flyers for hookers. What do you mean there was no money in the bags? Um, that's what they said, sir. I, I don't understand it. We both saw them putting money inside those bags. Benedict stops cold. He stares up at a wall where an engraved sign reading Bellagio has been smoke-stained. 
Walsh, cue up the tape of that robbery. Interior Bellagio Security Center. Walsh stands before several monitors as one of the guards cues up the masked men robbing the vault image of a few minutes ago, beside the present image of Benedict staring at the vault wall. Does it say Bellagio on the south wall of the vault? In the masked men image, it does not, in fact, say Bellagio. Uh, no, sir, it doesn't. I, I don't understand. <sighs> we have that installed on Tuesday. The image we saw of the men robbing us was a tape. What? Someone built a double of my vault, then made a tape of them robbing it. When we saw them putting money in those bags, that wasn't actually happening. Interior Security Center. Walsh's jaw drops as he watches the tape again. Uh, then, sir, what happened to all the money? Interior Bellagio. Close on a SWAT duffel bag. Carried through the Bellagio Casino, held by the SWAT leader, leading his men out, now eight in all. And at last, we pull up to see his face for the first time. It's Rusty in full regalia, leading Livingston, Turk, Saul, Frank, Basher, Yen, and Linus out of the casino, each dressed as a SWAT guy, each carrying a duffel bag with nearly $20 million inside. As we pass each man under the hum of the casino, we see flashback interior Mirador Suite. Livingston takes the call from Walsh in the Mirador Suite as Basher, Saul, and Frank dress behind him. 911, emergency response. Turk, dressed as a SWAT member, hustles down a cage corridor. Saul has trouble repelling with the rest. Basher takes position next to Rusty at the elevator shaft's bottom. They're on camera, but just a few feet away, uh, where Danny sits smiling off camera. Prepare to cut power. Yen lights a short fuse leading into the vault. Linus feigns hysteria. You're muted. Guys, someone's here. Rusty fires a spurt of blanks. Boom! No one is hurt, nor is the money stacked neatly in a corridor, ready to be packed into the phony SWAT team bags, body armor, etc. Exterior Bellagio Casino, present. The SWAT team exits and boards the second vehicle Turk and Virgil have been working on all this time. The one in the, we the warehouse with an air freshener hanging from its rearview mirror. It's a replica of a SWAT van. Turk takes the wheel as the others jump in the back. Rusty flips open another cell phone. Hey, uh, Las Vegas PD. This is Officer Brooks, New Jersey Probation Division. Uh, I've got a violator in your jurisdiction. Hit it. Turk hits the gas and the vehicle peels away, carrying its cadre of new multi-millionaires far away from the Bellagio Hotel and Casino. Interior Bellagio Vault. Benedict squats down to inspect a burnt scrap of paper on the vault floor. It's a flyer for a strip club. Oh, shit. Interior cage hallway, we are moving with Benedict. Heated, he approaches the interrogation room where his plainclothes goons keep watch. Where's Ocean? Still inside, sir, with Bruiser. Benedict straightens his cuffs, cools himself, and then... Open that door. Inside the interrogation room, Bruiser throws a mean left hook across Danny's face as the door swings open and Benedict steps in. Bruiser sees him and steps away, toweling off his bloodied knuckles. Benedict studies Danny. The man is a bloody mess. Head rolling, eyes puffed up. Wake him up. The goons step in, slap Danny alert. At last, Danny recognizes Benedict in the room. Hey, hey, you Benedict. How's the other fight going? Did you have a hand in this? Did you? Mm, did I have a hand in what? Get him out of here. As the goons scoop him up and drag him out, Danny catches Bruiser's eye for just a moment and barely winks. Interior, Benedict's suite. The phone rings. Tess picks it up. Hello? Turn to channel 88. Click. Tess does so. On her TV, a security angle of the cage hallway, the goons appear, escorting bloodied Danny out. As Tess gasps, we go live to the cage, where Benedict follows the goons and Danny out, brooding. What's his next step? Walsh approaches. He get robbed or something, Benedict? Jeez, that's a shame. Stop there. Where is my money? What would you say if I told you I could get your money back if you gave up Tess? What would you say? I would say yes. Interior, Benedict's suite. She's crestfallen. Interior, cage, hallway. 
Well, that is very interesting. But I didn't have anything to do with it. Escort Mr. Ocean to the exit and contact the police. I would imagine Mr. Ocean is in violation of his parole. In Benedict's suite on the TV, the goons haul Danny out. Tess has left, heartbeats ago. The room's door is just closing. Cage hallway. Maybe we should tell them. No, follow him. Everywhere. Interior, casino floor. Benedict exits, takes in his casino. It's been a bad night. He's down 150 million. He starts for the casino floor elevator bay. As he arrives, the elevator doors open and Tess steps out. She breezes right past him. Tess. Tess? You of all people should know, Terry. In your hotel, there's always someone watching. She keeps going. Benedict, now down 150 million and one woman, boards the elevator. Its doors close on him. Exterior alley vacant warehouse, early morning. The SWAT van rounds a corner and ducks inside the warehouse. Three and a half seconds pass, and the eight SWAT members reappear, now all in suits, perfectly pressed, and with grins on their faces and change in their pockets, they begin their victory stroll, single file and sloppy, right down the Las Vegas Strip. Turk, Livingston, Frank, Basher, Yen, Saul, Linus, and Rusty march down the strip, single file, and when they come to an intersection, Virgil and Reuben, also in suits, fall into stride for a victory lap in front of the Bellagio Fountains. Then, one by one, the group splinters off, strolling into different hotels or grabbing cabs until there are only two left, Rusty and Linus. They take each other in, shake hands, and part. Exterior Bellagio. Tess exits, searching for Danny. She rounds the building to the service entrance, where a Las Vegas Police Department squad car has just arrived to take goon-held Danny away. She runs towards. Wait! They wait. As Danny is handcuffed and prepared for loading in the back, he and Tess hold each other's glances. Danny, I'm sorry. I knew what I was doing. I didn't. A cop lowers Danny's head as he directs him into his seat. How long will it be? Uh, three to six months, I should think. The squad car door closes him in and Tess stands vigil as it pulls away. Across the street, Rusty watches Danny being driven back to prison, too. Exterior, front gate, minimum security prison, day. Three to six months later. The great metal gate opens once more, revealing Danny Ocean in its frame again, ready for release. He looks forward, no one's there to greet him, and the view of New Jersey looks no brighter than it did before. He takes his first step into free America to discover Rusty leaning against the prison wall. Beyond him sits his secondhand Mercedes from L.A. Looking for someone? 13 million and you drive that piece of shit cross country to pick me up. Hello to you too. <laughs> they shake hands. You know what? Your hair is a little grayer. Mm. You know what? Your eyes got a little closer together. How's life? Life? Life is a room full of pillows. <laughs> Come on. Moving with Danny and Rusty toward the Mercedes together again. So where do you want to go first? To a phone. Hmm. I stopped and picked up your personal effects and put them in the back seat. So my what? Danny gets to the passenger drawer and looks in to see Tess sitting in the back. She smiles at him. I'm not sure these belong to me. Sure they do. Danny and Rusty get in. Danny kisses Tess. Rusty starts the car. We need to find Rusty a girl. Yeah, good idea. You know, there's a women's prison just down the road. Mm. He drives off. In the back, Danny takes Tess's hand in his, notices a silver wedding band on it. You said you sold this. That's what I said. Liar. Thief. As they drive away, another car starts its engines, begins to follow. At the wheel, Benedict Schoons. The end. Yay! <laughs> in the chat, so hold on. That was so good. Oh my god, you guys! That was so great. That was so much fun. So good. Um, were you guys able? Okay, hold on. I'm gonna tell you when it ends in the chat. Um, were you guys able to read any of the comments? 
No. no. I wasn't no. looking. No, we, we didn't have YouTube open because it would have been an echo. Oh yeah. It was yeah. so adorable and loving. Okay. Okay. Really? So we must end it for them. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Thank you for tuning in. I can see all of us. Bye. Thanks for watching. Thanks for playing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put up a, a, a screen.